All right. YouTube going. YouTube's fired up. All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome. YouTube's getting going. Fix that there. Welcome, everybody, to another another evening of covering the world news. I'm your host, Andy Mercado. Welcome to Mercado Media, and we are live. Hey, Larry. How you doing, guys? Comment where you're tuning in from. What city, what state, where in the world you guys are tuning in from? What a busy day here in the United States for news. That's for sure. We had we had lots going on in the United States. We have some, some coverage to go over in Ukraine. You guys are definitely in the right spot. Live coverage as best we can. Hello, everybody. Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. I'm just pulling up the pulling up the stream so I can see more of the chat. Hello, hello. How you doing? How are you guys doing? I got the the subtitles on, closed captions on tonight. Everything should be good to go. All right. So today, world news updates on April 12th. 19 people were injured, 10 shot in a New York City subway station during the morning of rush hour, police said. Authorities say they are still looking for a suspect. The shooting took place at 36th Street Station in Brooklyn Sunset Park around 8.30 a.m. All victims are expected to survive. Frank James has been listed as a person of interest. Keys were found on the subway for a U-Haul van, later located by police approximately five miles from the incident that was related to Mr. James and, excuse me, that was rented to Mr. James in Philadelphia. James has addresses linking him to both Wisconsin and Philadelphia. According to USA Today, authorities say the gunman fired 33 times with a Glock 17 9mm semi-handgun, which was found in the subway. Searching the subway car, investigators also found two non-detonated smoke grenades, a hatchet, gasoline, fireworks, and keys to a U-Haul van. A reward of $50,000 is now being offered for any info regarding today's events. Let's look at this here. Let's look at this live on, or not live, but an update from Fox 5 from Brooklyn. I wish that would have popped up easier, but here we go. Let's check that out. Third and West Fourth Streets. Just after four o'clock this afternoon, police spotted, or somebody spotted, I should say, this white U-Haul van that they have been looking for for a good portion of the day. They believe this is uh, in connection with that shooting uh, on the subway earlier today in Brooklyn. The plates do match what the description of the van was put out there earlier there. You can see that van parked on the side of the road. Now, we can tell you right now that there's a large area of uh, Kings Highway shut down here from West Second to West Fifth Street. Police still waiting for more crews to arrive on the scene to investigate the situation but again the van is suspected of being connected to the incident on the subway in brooklyn here earlier uh is, has been found on king's highway we'll keep you up out of king's highway between west third and west fourth streets just after four o'clock this afternoon police spotted or somebody spotted i should say this white u-haul van that they have been looking for for a good portion of the day they believe this is uh, in connection with that shooting uh on the subway earlier today in brooklyn the plates do match what the description of the van was put out there earlier there you can see that van parked on the side of the road now we can tell you right now that there's a large area of uh king's highway shut down here from west second to west fifth street police still waiting for more crews to arrive on the scene to investigate the situation but again the van is suspected of being connected to the incident on the subway in Brooklyn here earlier uh, is, has been found on King's Highway. We'll keep you up. All right. And then let's go over what happened this morning. You can find these clips on Mercado Media <clears throat> on Facebook or on Twitter and retweeting. So this is some updates from New York City. And of course, we'll be going over Ukraine. There's there's news in Ukraine, too, but we're going to be including reports from around the world that are happening in current events with this stream as well. So this happened in New York City. Breaking at least 16 injured, 10 of which were shot, 5 in critical condition at New York 36th Street subway station in Brooklyn Sunset Park neighborhood just before 8.30 in the morning. So this is just before 8.30 in the morning in New York. Graphic. So this was inside the inside the subway station, New York City. So 
graphic graphic images at the end there. Let's continue on. This was uh, breaking pro f footage of possible audio audible gunshots and injured people pour out of a subway station in Brooklyn, New York. Train doors open, followed by a press conference giving the description of the suspect on the loose. <laughs> All right, and then here is from the. I'm hoping that this whole video will pull, the can go back. This is from the press conference a, a few hours ago. To get it on, hear, hear it straight from the the police. This was live. It's still live on the thing, but I had to rewind it. So a few hours ago now. Terrorism. We're here to provide an update on the ongoing investigation into the shooting that occurred earlier today in Brooklyn. We're going to hear from Police Commissioner of the City of New York, Keyshawn Sewell, uh, Chief of Department Ken Corey, we have First Deputy Commissioner Ed Caban here, Chief of Detectives James Essig will update us on the investigation. Uh, we also have Assistant Director in Charge of the FBI, in charge of the New York office, Mike Driscoll, um, and the JTTF efforts with the NYPD that are ongoing, as well as the special agent in charge of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, uh, John DeVito. But we'll begin with word from Gracie Manchin from the mayor of the city of New York, Eric Adams. He's talking. We can't. He's talking, but we cannot hear the mayor. Looks like they had technical issues with the mayor. <clears throat> Actually, I'd say this is about an hour and a half ago. I said a few hours ago. This feed is still going, but there it's a end. It's an end screen. This is the very latest on what happened in New York today. Thank you, Christine, for the super chat. Yeah, they couldn't get the mayor on the... They must have had technical difficulties. He does speak, though. They do get him on there eventually. Okay, okay. Thank you all for your patience. Technical issues annoy everybody. The 
apparently the. Uh, we're having an audio difficulty, so what we're going to do is regroup here. Uh, we're going to cut to. Hey, listen, New York Police Department having technology issues. I don't feel as bad now. As I'm sitting here in my own apartment having issues sometimes. This is the very latest on the events in New York City today. 19 people were injured, 10 shot in a New York City subway station. During morning rush hour, police said authorities said they were still looking for a suspect. The shooting took place at 36th Street Station in Brooklyn Sunset Park around 8.30 in the morning. This was a press conference about an hour and a half ago, which they went through uh, the further details that is uh, uh, made available to the public. Okay. Thank you all for attending this evening and helping us get this information out to the public. It's so important. We are truly fortunate that this was not significantly worse than it is. As we reported this afternoon, a man who was traveling on a Manhattan-bound N train opened two canisters that dispensed smoke throughout the subway car. He then shot multiple passengers as the train pulled into the 36th Street station in Sunset Park. Ten people were injured by gunfire, and an additional 13 were either uh, injured as the, they rushed to get out of the train station or they suffered smoke inhalation. Some good news is that none of the injuries appear to be life-threatening. Wow. As detectives processed the crime scene, they recovered a 9mm semi-automatic handgun, extended magazines, and a hatchet. Also found is a liquid we believe to be gasoline and a bag containing consumer-grade fireworks and a hobby fuse. About an hour ago, detectives located a U-Haul van in Brooklyn that we believe is connected to the suspect. At this time, we still do not know the suspect's motivation. Clearly, this individual boarded the train and was intent on violence. We are conducting a highly coordinated investigation that includes NYPD detectives, the FBI-NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force, and the ATF, who have been instrumental in tracing the firearm and ballistics. The suspect is a dark-skinned male and was wearing a neon orange vest and a gray-colored sweatshirt. We do have a person of interest in this investigation, but we need the public assistance with additional information. We're asking anyone with information to call Crime Stoppers at 800-577-TIPS. We know this incident is of grave concern to New Yorkers. We cannot lose sight of victims in this city. We will use every resource we can to bring those to justice who continue to prey on the citizens of New York I'll ask Chief James Essex to come in and give details of the investigation. Like the video and subscribe to the channel if you have Good evening, not done everybody. So. Today at 8.24 a.m. aboard a Manhattan-bound N train, 10 people were shot, seven males, three females, and they were remo removed to area hospitals. An additional 13 people suffered injuries related to smoke inhalation, falling down, or a panic attack. The information I'm about to give you is preliminary and it's subject to change right now. As that end train was between stations 59th Street and the 36th Street stations, seated in the second car in the rear corner was a dark-skinned male. Various descriptions of his height are given. He is heavy set wearing an orange-green nylon-type construction vest. He also had on a gray hoodie, a surgical mask, and a neon-green construction helmet. As the train approached the 36th Street station, witnesses state the male opened up two smoke grenades, tossed them on the subway floor, brandishes a Glock 9mm handgun, he then fired that weapon at least 33 times, wow. striking 10 people. The male then fled the scene, and detectives are actively trying to determine his whereabouts. Recovered at that scene was a Glock 17 9 millimeter handgun, three extended Glock-type magazines. One was still in the weapon, one under a seat, and one in a backpack. We had 33 discharged shell casings, 15 bullets, five bullet fragments, two detonated smoke grenades, two non-detonated smoke grenades, 
a hatchet, a black garbage can, a black milk type style rolling cart, the gasoline, and a U-Haul key. The U-Haul key at the scene led us to the recovery of a U-Haul van a short while ago in Brooklyn. The male, who we believe is the renter of this U-Haul in Philadelphia, is a Frank R. James, male 62 years old, with addresses in Wisconsin and Philadelphia. We are endeavoring to locate him to determine his connection to the subway shooting, if any. The addresses in Philadelphia and Wisconsin. Anything, I mean, if they, if there's a manhunt in Wisconsin or anything going on, maybe I can get over there and see and cover it. The two crime scenes, the subway and the van, are very active and are still being processed. We are asking for anyone's help with information, cell phone video, witness information, or any, if they can identify the perpetrator or the renter of this vehicle, to call Crime Stop. Is it 1 800 577 tips? There is a $50,000 reward out right now. 25,000 from the New York City Police Foundation, 12,500 from the MTA, and 12,500 from the TWA Local 100. I just want to assure everyone that we in the NYPD have all our resources working this, along with our partners in the FBI and the ATF, to find this perpetrator. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Driscoll. Gonna, oh, the mayor? Okay. Mayor, uh, okay. This is a New York City mayor. Mr. Mayor, we're ready for you. Looks like something out of Batman, huh? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Commissioner and, and Chief. As we indicated, uh, today was a difficult day for New York. And days like these are playing out too often in cities across America. As mentioned this morning, we witnessed an act of violence and evil in the heart of Brooklyn, where a shooter attacked a subway car full of innocent people at the 36th Street Station. We saw a quiet Tuesday morning turn the end train into a war zone as a smoke bomb was detonated and multiple shots rang out. We witnessed 20 individuals have been injured so far, as it was mentioned. And thanks to the quick thinking of the MTA crew and the bravery and cooperation of passengers, lives were saved. And thanks to our first responders, the injured were quickly taken to area hospitals, and all of them are expected to recover. You know I have been realistic and outspoken about my commitment to protecting public safety. I stand by that and will continue to do everything in my power to dam the rivers that feed the sea of violence. But this is not only a New York City problem. This rage, this violence, these guns, these relentless shooters are an American problem. And it's going to take all levels of government to solve it. It is going to take the entire nation to speak out and push back against the cult of death that has taken hold in this nation. A cult that allows innocents to be sacrificed on a daily basis. A country with buying weapons of mass destruction is as easy as picking up a piece of plywood or a garden shovel. So he's doing political talk right now. So he's he got the he's touching on the events and now he's kind of doing some political speech. A country. Yeah, it's kind of some. It sounds like something out of Gotham, doesn't it? Or something out from it's it's in New York City, but the the whole thing is. Terrible. Where there are more guns than people. Very glad that nobody was killed from this today. Very, I mean, it's it's a miracle that nobody was. There are over 400 million guns in this country alone. The U.S. gun homicide rate is 26 times that of other high-income countries. Where over 100 people die in gun violence every day. Guns are the leading cause of death for American children and teens like the 16-year-old baby we lost in the Bronx. From schools in Columbine, Sandy Hook, and Virginia, to music festivals in Las Vegas, to nightclubs in Orlando, to movie theaters and yoga classes across the nation. These killers have used weapons of mass destruction 
to massacre innocent people. They control no armies or military forces, yet these individual killers terrorize our nation. I have often said that this city is not going to adapt to dysfunction. Ending gun violence means changing gun laws. We cannot clean up a flood when the water is still pouring into the basement. And we can never stop the killing if we cannot stop the guns. To be clear, we will not surrender our city to the violent few, and we will not surrender all of America to this cult of death. The sea of violence comes from many rivers. We must dam every river that feeds the greater crisis. That is the work of my life, this administration, and this police department. I will not stop until the peace we deserve becomes the reality we experience. You have my word as a former police officer, a fellow New Yorker, and your mayor, that we will end this epidemic, and that will capture the individual responsible for today's attack. We will capture him and prosecute him to the full extent of the law. I wish she would have just. I wish she would have kept it at that, or like. Uh kept the message on that focus a little longer. You went into posturing for an extended period of time and then brought it back to the focus point. But I mean, I mean, man, I wish the posturing would have waited until a little later. Thank you, NYPD, FDNY, our first responders, and the collaboration from the federal government, the state, the city agencies. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to turn it over to Assistant Special Agent in Charge at the FBI in New York office, Michael Driscoll. Thank you, Commissioner. I want to start by expressing our hopes and prayers that the victims of this event will enjoy a quick recovery. They are our primary focus right now. I also want to echo the thanks. Enjoy a quick recovery. Some, man, sometimes people choose the wrong. The wrong, the wrong words in the wrong situations. Enjoying it, I mean, we're we're thankful that they're, they're it's a blessing that they're able to have a recovery and nobody was killed. For the I partnership, about, I don't know if anybody that was there in the subway are enjoying anything that they're going through right now. To the NYPD, the ATF, and all the partners who are contributing to this investigation. Right now, the FBI NYPD Joint Terrorism Task Force is fully engaged with this investigation, <laughs> providing assistance through manpower technical assistance, and basically everything we can throw at it. We expect the process to be a long one as we gather all possible information to track down all possible leads. And I would encourage you, as it was mentioned earlier, to please reach out to the NYPD tip line at 1-800-577-TIPS. And I would also add, as frequently the case in many of our current investigations, uh, everyone's got a cell phone in their pocket. There's a lot of video out there. If you have digital information that you'd like to share with, with us in connection with this investigation, please visit fbi.gov slash Brooklyn shooting where you can upload that information. So we are seeking the public's help. You heard mentioned before of a name of possible interest. Videos would be particularly helpful or any other additional witnesses who have yet to come forward that can provide information uh, that might help this investigation. You can upload videos straight to the FBI website now. <clears throat> Interesting. So thank you for your participation, and I thank everyone for their partnership in the course of the investigation. Thank you. We'll take a couple of questions. Your point? Yeah, Commissioner Sewell, is it the belief that he fled on foot after abandoning the van where he was gone? We are not sure where he went at this point. That is subject to investigation. We have a number of resources that are combing on foot and doing video canvases as well to determine where he went. Post? I'm no sorry. Post? So based on some preliminary information, there were some postings possibly connected to our person of interest where he mentions homelessness, he mentions New York, and he does mention Mayor Adams. And as a result of that, in an abundance of caution, we're going to tighten the mayor's security detail. Yeah. Just to be clear, so this person, Frank James, he's not the person of interest that is in custody at this moment? I don't have an answer to that. We we have no one in custody at this time. No. We are looking for Frank James. We know he rented this U-Haul van. The key of that U-Haul van was found at the crime scene in the subway. And Mr. James made those social media posts? We're pouring through that, but yes, correct. And you believe he was the one in the train? Is that correct? 
we, we are looking to determine if he has any connection to the train. We know Mr. James rented that U-Haul truck in Philadelphia. So we're not calling them threats. He made some concerning posts or someone made some concerning posts. We cannot attribute it to that individual yet. That's not an investigation. But again, in an abundance of caution, we're going to tighten the mayor's security detail. That's all. Rocco, Daily News. Does he have connections? Do you have any connection at all to the train system? Is he a TA worker? And any connection whatsoever to that subway station? That is subject to investigation. We don't have that information yet. Does he have a criminal record? John Doyle, see this, sir? Does he have a criminal record? <laughs> <laughs> What is Mr. James is just a person of interest we know right now who rented that U-Haul van in Philadelphia. The keys to that U-Haul van were found in the subway mm -hmm. in our shooter's possessions. We don't know right now if Mr. James has any connection to the subway. That's still under investigation. His name's already out there, though, at this point. That's a tough, man. That's so... You guys, let's listen to that one more one more time. So that's the crucial information right there. All this being said, the mayor talking, everything that is the that is the the accurate and relevant information up to up to date, accurate and relevant information pertaining to this. Made some concerning posts. We cannot attribute it to that individual yet. That's under investigation. But again, in an abundance of caution, we're going to tighten the mayor's security detail. That's all. Rocco, Daily News. Does he have That is subject to investigation. We don't have that information yet. Does he have a criminal record? <laughs> All right, here. This is the accurate, relevant information summarized. Mr. James is just a person of interest we know right now who rented that U-Haul van. In and the U-Haul van in question looks like this. At King's Highway between West 3rd and West 4th Streets. Just after 4 o'clock this afternoon, police spotted, or somebody spotted, I should say, this white U-Haul van that they have been looking for for a good portion of the day. They believe this is uh, in connection with that shooting uh, on the subway earlier today in Brooklyn. The plates do match what the description of the van was put out there earlier there. You can see that van parked on the side of the road. Now, we can tell you right now that there's a large area of uh, King's Highway shut down here from West 2nd to West 5th Street. Police still waiting for more crews to arrive on the scene to investigate the situation. But again, the van is suspected of being connected to the incident on the subway in Brooklyn here earlier. Uh, it has been found on King's Highway. We'll keep you up. All right. That's the U-Haul they're talking about. In Philadelphia. The keys to that U-Haul van. Made some keys to that. We don't have that information yet. Does he have a criminal record? John Doyle, see this, sir? Does he have a criminal record? <laughs> I think he's on his way back to Wisconsin. Mr. James is just a person of interest we know right now who rented that U-Haul van in Philadelphia. The keys to that U-Haul van were found in the subway in our shooter's possessions. We don't know right now if Mr. James has any connection to the subway. That's still under investigation. Uh, Chief Essek, do you have any The crime scene is still being processed now. The van is being processed, and the subway crime scene is being processed. But we, it's too early right now to tell. City um, Their audios, their audio is coming out of one ear. So you might, you likely, if you're listening with headphones on, put your other one in. It's not my audio. This is from the live feed from the press conference. But yeah, I know it's only single audio, so it's likely only one ear. The, the video, the YouTube videos and the videos on t there there's a man who posts in there, Frank James. We're still working to see if that's our person who rented the video. And where was you all located? Uh, Kings Highway in Brooklyn. Kings Highway in what intersection? 30 West 4th, West 4th and Kings Highway. There were general uh, topics of concern, and I, I don't want to go into too many details about the mayor's security detail. We're just doing it uh, just to be on the safe side. Any other details about homelessness? You mentioned that you posted about homelessness. 
complaints about homelessness, complaints about New York, nothing in general. I'm sorry, just general comments that cause us some concern that are subject to investigation at this point. Why were there no working surveillance cameras in the station? Why did police radios not work in the station? And how much did those factors hamper this investigation? Yeah, we know that there were three stations that the video wasn't working. We're still investigating that to see why or how those, uh, whether it was a mechanical problem, electrical issue, why those videos weren't up. The po there was no issues with police radios. So the reports that uh, for one of the first officers on the scene said his radio wasn't working, and he told one of the teenagers there to call 911. Yeah, so patrol officers, so officers who work topside, if you will, in patrol precincts, when they go down the station, they have to switch frequencies. It's a UHF versus VHF. So if they didn't switch the radio over to the U to the VHF frequency, they would not be able to transmit down in the. I've side. seen this this guy. I mean, I'm not from New York at all. I live in Minnesota, but I've seen this guy lots from even from the, the 2020 protests. He was, he had wore the white, the white uniform, the white police uniform that in New York, I've seen him all the time. Subway station. So it's user error. It wasn't a problem with the actual radio. Bloomberg news. I don't even, I don't know who he is, but I've seen him. Yeah. He's tall, tall as hell. So we, we don't typically assign officers to subway stations. Officers patrol on a rotating basis. They ride trains. They come out. They patrol the stations. Patrol officers from the precincts stop, go down. They do station inspections. We've been doing that since January. So that, that station was patrolled several times today. There were no officers present in the station uh, at the time of the shooting, but it had been patrolled several times on this calendar date prior to the shooting in the early morning hours. Next question. What do we know about Mr. James? So he asked if you guys can't hear, uh, what are Mr. James's ties to New York City? So the the suspect. We know Mr. James. Ha Mr. James has addresses in Wisconsin and Philadelphia. As far as New York, still under investigation, but he's just a person of interest right now in this case. We there, that question was just about video in the subway station that you guys are asking about. No, the shooter was was entered the station on Kings Highway. So we're asking for anybody who knows from Kings Highway to 35th Street is eight stops. Anybody who sees him with any information, please call Crime Stoppers. We literally have hundreds of detectives out in the field right now, pouring through video at train stations, the egresses, uh, the recovery sites of the vehicle. So we hope to have clearer pictures of who we believe is the shooter. Those from New York, is that, people are asking, is that the NYPD flag? The green, the, the white, and the blue flag behind them? I haven't seen that one. Well, it's got stars in it too. Person of interest, yes, Angela. That's pull, as far as pulling the trigger. That's still under investigation. As far as the firearm is concerned, we know it's not part of a multi-sale. We know it's not stolen. We're working with our partners in the ATF to cr track back to the point of sale and then move forward on that gun. Hey, last last question. question. Your physical description of James, does it match the description that's already been put out today? Uh, 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 again, as I said, we there was two smoke grenades thrown. We have various descriptions of height. I gave the description out of the man with the vest. We're looking through all, all possible leads on a person of interest. I, I think if you look at our social media, you'll see two photos of the person of interest. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. All right. That was the press conference that wrapped up. It was like about an, about two and a half hours ago. This feed is still live for some reason. Started streaming five hours ago. They were out there on the scene. Oh, man, you can't even go back to it now. Oh, here. They were out there. There's the U-Haul van. So Washington Post was sitting out there, and then they went live in the press conference. So that is the very latest. They have a person of interest, lives in Pennsylvania, and has a residence in Wisconsin. 
Frank James. All right. Frank James has been listed as a person of interest. Keys were found in the subway for a U-Haul van, later located by police approximately five miles from the incident that was rented to Mr. James in Philadelphia. James is, has addresses linking him to both Wisconsin and Philadelphia. According to USA Today, authorities say the gunman fired 33 times with a Glock 17 9mm semi-handgun, which was found in the subway. Searching the subway car, investigators also found two non-detonated smoke grenades, a hatchet, gasoline, fireworks, and keys to a U-Haul van. A reward of 50000 is now being offered for any information regarding today's events. And then they're still processing the U-Haul van. They're still processing the subway station and, their, and, and the belongings of the, of the, uh, the suspect. They're still processing all of those things. We'll likely have a further update tomorrow. All right, so with that being said, now we're going to get into our coverage and other other news in the United States I should touch on before we get into Ukraine. Uh, comedian Gilbert Gottfried, who voiced the parrot Lago in Disney's 1992 animated film Aladdin, has passed away at the age, excuse me, at the age of 67. So Gilbert Gottfried, and here's a here's a note from that they posted, excuse me, on his Twitter from Gilbert Gottfried and his family. We are heartbroken to announce the passing of our beloved Gilbert Gottfried after a long illness. In addition to being the most iconic voice in comedy, Gilbert was a wonderful husband, brother, friend, and father to his two young children. Although today is a sad day for all of us, please keep laughing as loud as possible in Gilbert's honor. Love, the Gottfried family. All right. All right, y'all, as we're checking in, let's get the Ukraine war coverage going here. Uh, we're going to have a short intro and then we're going to hop right into it. So as we're as we're starting the as we're starting the Ukraine coverage, comment where you're tuning in from, what city, what state, where in the world you guys are watching from. See you guys after the intro.
right, y'all. So diving into the war in Ukraine, Finnish telecommunications company Nokia has announced its departure from the Russian market. We got Eugene Oregon's tune in. Oh, we got lightning outside. I might turn off the, yo, I might turn off the music. Big thunder and lightning outside in Minnesota. We have a thunderstorm going outside right now, y'all. Big thunderstorm out here in Minnesota in the Twin Cities. That was a big one. I just muted the music. Maybe you guys can hear some of the lightning and thunder in the background. We got Champagne, Illinois. Keep checking in, y'all. Let me know where you guys are watching from. So Finnish telecommunications company Nokia has announced its departure from the Russian market. That is the latest uh, major company to leave Russia, Nokia. Those, the old phones and the uh, antenna phones. Russia is deploying heavy military equipments towards the border with Finland after Finland and Sweden are considering joining. Oh, yeah, there's going to be another big thunder here soon. It's it's really the flash is outside. I have my window right here. Let's see Sweden. That is the biggest news I say Sweden and Finland want to join NATO. And Russia's moving their their troops closer to the Sweden wins the NATO lottery. Agree. Wow. Let's look at this really quick, y'all. Sweden and Finland make moves to join NATO. Sweden's ruling party has begun debating whether the country should join NATO, and neighboring uh, Finland expects to reach a decision within weeks, as Moscow warned the Nordic nation's accession would not bring stability to Europe. Can you guys hear the, the lightning out there, the thunder? Miles and miles of wide storm. Yes, it's, it's storming bad outside. Can you guys hear it? I try to I move I even move the mic a little closer to the window. Maybe you guys can hear some rain and thunder sounds in the background. Both countries are officially non-aligned militarily, but public support for NATO membership has almost doubled since Russia's invasion of Ukraine to about 50% in Sweden and 60% in Finland. Multiple opinion polls suggest Sweden center-left social democrats led by Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson said their security review was about more than just joining the 30-nation alliance, adding that the party could decide to apply even without the backing of members. You guys are right now, you're looking at, we're reading a news story about Sweden and Finland moving to join NATO, and then Russia moving their, their troops along the border. So, like, as much as we have going on in the United States, I mean, there's world war implications going on here in Ukraine. I know a lot of you are tuned in. You saw the New York City update, and you, this might be your first Mercado Media stream. We've been covering the war in Ukraine since day one. Information's getting tight coming out of Ukraine. So, I mean, for f over 50 days, in a, 50 days, I covered the, no, what day are we at now? 49? I mean, it said 49 or 50. Where's John? John posts. And now... We're just in a point where people are interested in hearing some other news as well that's going on in the world. So I've incorporated that day 48. No, so that means we're on day 49 then. So we're almost on day 50 in Ukraine. And at this point in the war now, it's getting information's tight, but there's still other news and happenings going on around there. And as, I mean, the, the, the news in New York City is pretty big, so... Uh, we're going to be incorporating other news into our into the coverage. Both countries are officially non-aligned mil militarily, but public support for NATO membership has almost doubled since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in about 50% in, in Sweden and 60% in Finland. Sweden center-left Social Democrats, led by Prime Minister Magdalena Anderson, said their security review was about more than just joining the 30-nation alliance, adding that party could decide to apply even with the backing of members. <clears throat> Having stressed at the outbreak of the war that non-alignment had, quote, served Sweden's interests well, Anderson said that she was ready to discuss the policy in light of Moscow's aggression, and in late March she did not, excuse me, she did not rule out joining NATO. When Russia invaded Ukraine, Sweden's security position changed fundamentally, and the party said in a statement on Monday, the Social Democrat General Secretary Tobias Bowden said the secretary review could be complete, quote, before the summer. The question is expected to be a key issue in parliamentary elections due on September, September 11th. 
with center-right opposition parties already saying they would back a NATO application and the far-right Sweden Democrats. See, this is, listen, there's Americans in the chat, right? How do, like, this probably melts your brain, right? Far-right Sweden Democrats. Does that make any sense to Americans? Probably not. But I hope that, I hope even just this little sentence alone opens your brain a little more that the, the, uh, the politics in the United States are, aren't, like they are around the world, okay? Also open to the idea. Finland, which shares a 1,340 kilometer, 830 mile border with Russia and like Sweden is a NATO partner after abandoning its position. After abandoning its position of strict neutrality at the end of the Cold War is expected to outline its decision regarding the alliance before midsummer. This is a big deal because Russia's like on the whole, if you join NATO, we got beef. If you join NATO, it's a problem. And then Russia will say that expansion of NATO is bad for is bad for Europe, but yet like do things to make countries want to join NATO. All right, the, the the countries are joining NATO on their own. Sweden and Finland. So let's continue on. So. Russia is he Russia is deploying heavy military equipments towards the border with Finland after Finland and Sweden consider joining NATO. Over 440,000 square meters or 20% of all warehouses, logistical property in the Kiev Oblast have been destroyed by Russian attacks. Source estimation by Federer Abrazov, the head of security and logistic property department at retail and development advisor company. The Arxler Middle partially relaunches production in the Krivira steel plant. 1,000 tons of cast iron to be produced today. The plant has established new logistics to get raw materials and ship products. Marine Le Pen spoke out today the ban on oil and gas supplies from Russia. The French presidential candidate said that in general she supports sanctions against Russia, but not the ban of oil and gas supplies. So that is from from France. They they. Sp Spoke out against ban on oil and gas from Russia. The presidential candidate said that in general she supports sanctions against Russia, but not the. So, like, what sanctions then? Oil and gas are the only two sanctions that would affect them. Uh, pro, pro Kremlin lawmaker Putin uh, Medvedchuk has been captured. Zelensky announced that Viktor Medvedchuk, a lawmaker with the pro Kremlin party opposition platform, was captured by the security service. Medvedchuk. Medvedchuk is accused of treason. He escaped house arrest in February. 2,671 people evacuated from hot spots on April 12th. Most of them, 2,343 people fled Mariupol, Berdyansk, Poloni, Poloni Melitopol, and Vaslivka. They arrived by their own cars to Zaporizhia, according to Deputy Prime Minister Ernia Verischuk. Vladimir Putin vowed Tuesday that Russia's bloody offensive in Ukraine could, con excuse me, would continue until its goals are fulfilled and insisted the campaign was going as planned. Despite a major withdrawal in the face of stiff Ukrainian opposition and significant losses, he said Russia, quote, had no other choice but to launch what he calls a, quote, special military operation and vowed it would, quote, continue until completion and the fulfillment of the tasks have been set. So that is... The latest updates, big updates from the war in in Ukraine, and I was gonna look up the Medve, Medvedchuk, Victor Medvedchuk. Let's look up this really quick from the BBC. Ukraine fugitive Putin ally Medvedchuk arrested. Here's his arrest photo. Let me zoom out. Oops. Oh my goodness. Or I could just close out all my sources. That totally works too. One second, y'all. There we go. Just close out all my sources. Let's look that back up one more time. Big apologies. I was trying to make it a little smaller. There we go. Now you guys can see the whole photo. Here's his arrest photo. Ukraine says it arrested fugitive pro-Russian pol pol politician Viktor Medvedchuk, seen as President Vladimir Putin's closest ally in the country. So here's his, here it is. He's wearing a Ukraine uniform, military uniform. Ukraine Security Service SBU posted a photo purportedly 
showing Mr. Medvedchuk in handcuffs and wearing Ukrainian military fatigues. He had been under house arrest in the capital of Kiev on suspicion of treason, but escaped soon after Russia invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February. Mr. Medvedchuk, 67, denies all wrongdoing. In his nightly video addressed to the nation on Tuesday, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky offered to exchange Mr. Medvedchuk for Ukrainian, quote, boys and girls who are now in Russian captivity. He earlier wrote on Facebook that Mr. Medvedchuk had been arrested after a special operation by the SBU. Let's click on this from the BBC. <clears throat> in photos, Mariupol in ruins as Russian offensive intensifies. So Matt Medvedchuk, they have him and they're working. They're looking to work him into deals. Seems like. What do you guys, maybe I should, let's do this poll. Because we do have a lot of, we actually, as I was signing out yesterday, uh, people were checking in from Sweden and Finland. So let's end this poll. Thank you to everybody that participated. We had 62% believe that the New York shooting suspect fled New York and he's gone. There is a, I mean, that's 62%. So a lot of people still believe that he's still in New York. But I'm going to put up a poll. Um, do you... I was going to say, do you agree or uh, do you uh, do you support Sweden and Finland joining NATO? And especially if you're from these two countries, please vote. If you if you live in these two countries, and we do have uh, people from Sweden and Finland that tune in. Do you agree? Give me one second. I'm putting the poll up right now. Sweden. All right, new poll is up. <clears throat> Thank you guys for that. New poll is good to go. Go ahead and cast your votes. The everybody makes polls everywhere, and none of us participate in them. But yet, but yet, there's uh, apparently polls out there. The, the polls say. The polls say. Yeah, these are the only polls that we get to invite to. <laughs> where, where do they put the Where do they put the poll invites out to? That's someone outside honking. All right, let's continue on. In photos, Mariupol in ruins as Russian offensive intensifies. This picture shows a par partially destroyed Mariupol drama theater. Let's zoom back in a little more. The drama theater in Mariupol. And again, Mariupol is here on the map. Only city left down here to the, to the southeastern part of Ukraine. The only region left down here. You had Marines that were there <clears throat> pretty much saying both some were saying goodbyes or that they fought to the very end yesterday. And then some that were posting uh, motivational videos saying that we're not going anywhere and we're going to fight to the end. So Mariupol still stands in Ukraine's hand, but it's a big war zone in there. This city is just a war-torn, war-zone city right now between Russian forces, Chechen forces. Or excuse me, the Chechens are fighting for Russia, but there's a Chechen unit in there. You got the you got the Azov battalion in there, but again, you have other Ukrainian units as well, including the Ukra the Marines are in there in Mariupol. And then over here, this is the Donbass. Here's Lugansk and Donetsk, and then Russian forces are looking to take. This region, Kremetyorsk, Slovyansk, major, major cities that Russia is looking to take. They have all their forces stacked in here in Kupiansk. In Kupiansk, and you can see that even reports, these, these blips are reports. So they're geolocated happening. So 21 hours ago, Russian forces shelled Lugansk Oblast overnight on April 12th. Lugansk Oblast Governor Serhii Hadai reported that Russian forces attacked Severin, Donetsk, Lishtyansk, Kremig, I'm sorry, some of these cities, y'all, are tough, Krem, Kremina, and Novo Druhesk and Rubenzin. So they're hitting soft targets, they're shelling this area, and they're looking to make it, uh, they're mo looking to make an advance in here to take the rest of Donbass, uh, facing heavy Ukrainian defense. 
I can't even say, I used to say yet in, in like being presumptuous that Russia was going to take territory. And I've been, I've been having to retract that every time. So they, I, I was early on concerned that Russia was going to take Kiev and it all looked, it looked like that. And then Ukraine, Ukraine's military defended the city and pushed them back and repelled Russian forces back to the east. So this is where the Russian forces are in the red. They're to the east of Ukraine now. They used to be to the northwest, to the northeast, and to the northwest, up in Chernobyl and up and around Chernihiv. But in the in the last week, the Russian forces have been expelled over to the eastern region, east and north of Kharkiv, with lots of convoys and uh, tactical operations being conducted south of Kharkiv uh, to try to reinforce Izium the city of Izium, which went back and forth between Ukrainian hands and Russian hands, but now it's in Russian, uh, Russian, uh, controlled territory. So the map really hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, We, I, we're going to be seeing Rob's video from speak the truth to, for a more detailed version of this. Uh, he gives a little bit more detailed version. He has contacts in the military in Ukraine's military that are able to provide a little more, a little more, uh, precise map than the live UA map can at this time. So let's continue on. Ukrainian military is trapped in Mariupol as Russian forces advance in the key southern port city, Mikio Podolia, an official from Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky's office, has tweeted. Do they have the source for that? Yep. This was at 10.24 a.m. on April 12th, so this was this morning. If the Kremlin now hates something more than Ukraine, it is the word Mariupol. One and a half months, our defenders defend the city from the Russian horde, which is 10 times larger. They are kept under bombardment and bite into every meter of the city. They make Russia pay with a very high price. Let's continue on. Our soldiers remain trapped in the city and have problems with supplies. The country's military and political leadership is aware of the problem, monitors the situation in real time, and has more information than is known on social networks. The president and the leadership of the armed forces are doing everything possible and impossible to find a solution to help our soldiers, but we cannot communicate our plans and actions publicly without informing the enemy. Please treat this with understanding. That is from the advisor to the head of the office of president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. So as an advisor for the president. Let's go back. Our sol- so we read that Mariupol has come under intense bombardment from Russian forces since early March. And I'm gonna some pictures too along, guys. Lots of gray. I mean, the city just looks like uh, gray, just destruction. No, no vegetation. All the trees are completely. Uh, I mean, it's. Just incredibly sad every time we see uh, images and video from Mariupol. The city lies between the pro-Russia breakaway regions of Donetsk and Lugansk in the east and annexed Crimea in the south. Seizing the city has been a major goal of the Russian offensive. Zelensky has said that tens of thousands of people had likely been killed in Mariupol. Yeah, it looks dead. It looks the city. There's a there's some vegetation from the grass, but the buildings are charred. Uh, it's, there's smoke in the city at all times. The BBC has not verified the figure, but reports from the region and the refugees fleeing the city spoke of bodies lying in the streets and most buildings damaged or destroyed. Biden accused Russia of genocide. Is this today? Okay, there's an ad. Apologies. I should just look that up on... Twitter. This is all today. Was a cluster bomb used in Ukraine train station attack? How do I mute the sound though? We can do this. Your family budget, your ability to- So this was from today. Didn't a bur- This is Biden talking in front of some John Deere tractors. Let's look, I want to look this up further, though, but this is a timeline from the events from today from the BBC, but I'll look into this more. Again, y'all, I don't... So this is my style, right? 
I I read, react the news. I mean, I do my own reporting when I can, when I can get out there. I don't, I didn't watch any of this today because then I will have a bias going into it, right? I'll have a, I'll have a, a further understanding of it. I like to read and react to it with you guys live. That's just how I do it. So I don't, I didn't see any of this today. I don't because it'll just ruin my whole day. Honestly, I save it for the night stream and then read and react to it with y'all. Okay. That's my, that's my style. So I didn't see any of this today. This is uh, Joe Biden accused Putin of genocide in Ukraine. Your family budget, your ability to fill up your tank, none of it should hinge on whether a dictator declares war and commits genocide in a half a world away. To help deal with this Putin price hike, I've authorized the release of one million barrels per day for the next six months from our strategic petroleum reserve. This is by far the largest release of our national reserve in history. It's a wartime bridge to increase oil supply as we work to, with U.S. Producer, oil producers to ramp up their production this year. I'm sorry, did I miss the part about genocide? Budget, your ability to fill up your tank, none of it should hinge on whether a dictator declares war and commits genocide in a half a world away. To help deal with this Putin price hike, I've authorized the release of one million barrels per day for the next six months from our strategic petroleum reserve. This is by far the largest release of our national reserve in history. It's a wartime bridge to increase oil supply as we work to, with U.S. Producer, oil producers to ramp up their production this year. I must have missed the part about genocide. He's talking about oil production. Uh, United States, we... Uh, we tapped in, uh, we're tapping into our wartime oil reserves to help with the cost of oil right now in the United States, which I mean, is pretty cheap compared to around the world, but we're still seeing like nearly $4 a gallon. All right. was a cluster bomb used in Ukraine station attack. The BBC has found evidence that a cluster bomb banned by many countries under international law was used in an attack on the Kramatorsk railway station in Ukraine. Here's Kramatorsk on the map. That's the railway station. A railway destroyed. That's a different, different piece of news. This is that train station we went over a few days ago. He said it there. I want to find, uh, we'll find further on that. That's from the, this is the BBC's timeline. Cluster bombs delivered a payload of bomblets that spread out and explode over a wide area. More than 50 people died in the attack on the station, which was crowded with people. He said in the beginning, okay. BBC journalists who visited the station after the attack found patterns consistent with the use of cluster munitions warhead. The resulting multiple explosions typically scatter fragments around the site of the main impact site of the missile, leaving telltale pockmark indentations. Remains of a Soviet-era Tokayu missile were found in the aftermath of the attack. It is a short-range, single-warhead ballistic missile that can be fitted with a cluster warhead that carries 50 bomblets. This is how a cluster munition works. The impact mark is pretty consistent with a sub-munition like the 9N24, a Soviet-era cluster munition that can be carried by the Tokayu. Munitions is fired from ground or air. Bomblets are released. Bomblets fall to the ground. Not all, not all detonate immediately. Good evening, good evening. Twenty-seven-year-old refugee heading back to Kiev. I feel guilty about sitting here in silence and doing nothing. The twenty-seven-year-old Ludmila. Sharkova struggled with her decision to leave the Ukrainian capital with her family on the second day of the war. In this video diary of, for the BBC, she explains why she asked to return to her home city. I want to spend this war, you know, at home. I really want to go back to Kyiv. Yeah, gas in America is cheap compared to around the world. But I have to accept it. And I'm trying. Oh, there's the president. 
It's a basic scene. I'm okay. I'm, uh, you don't have to. Anybody seen pictures of me. Zelensky? I mean, just let's go back quick. Look at how young Zelensky looks. And now, if you see a picture of him, he looks like he's aged about 20, 30 years in the 50 days that it's that this invasion's gone on. Look how young he looks. He doesn't look like that at all. He's got bags under his eyes. Just looks, I mean, he's been through it. I'm okay. I'm, uh, you don't have to be worried about me. I feel guilty about sitting here in silence and do nothing. All days are like the same. I was so demoralized. Uh, I have cried all evening. The news from Mariupol are terrible. Again. This was the... This was the maternity hospital that was bombed. That was the maternity hospital in, in Mariupol. Person who, whom I know personally, they were sitting for a week in Bucha. They escaped like a miracle from there. They are people who really, I'm sorry, deserves for these opportunities from abroad. I don't. It was snowing at night. My uh, boyfriend made some coffee, so I cried. <laughs> he said to me what I felt, the same thing, that he was ashamed of escaping from Kyiv. Here we are now, and it is too quiet. No explosions at all. Yes, the maternity, moment, yes, I it was in use, yep. Woke up and realized that what I really want, you know, from my heart is to go home to Kyiv. Now I'm trying to accept, and maybe I have accepted. Uh, Would you have left? Maybe that should be the next poll. We got 87% of y'all agreed with Sweden and Finland joining NATO. Would you have left? Whatever city if you had a, an invading force coming in would you have left your hometown or your home city uh, i mean I, I can almost bet that even if this poll the real answers wouldn't be the i bet a lot of people would leave a lot of pe more people would leave than than would stay that's just how the fact of life situation as it is <laughs> but go I ahead and go ahead and comment though I must act like I feel. Be honest. And the most important thing is to feel something now, you know? And I really want to go to Kyiv. I'm I'm putting the poll up right now. That's the end of the piece of reporting. Just talk going over a a 27 year old refugee that feels guilty for leaving, or they, they feel guilty for leaving initially. But a lot of people would leave though. The more, more the majority of people would leave their home city, and then come back when it's safe. The White House is preparing to send Ukraine another 750 million in weapons, according to U.S. media. The shipment will be authorized this week, NBC reports, with Reuters, with Reuters saying it could come as soon as Wednesday. So tomorrow, so what time is it? It's 6.54 in the morning in Kiev. The time is right above me. People that have been asking what's up with, or look up, where is it? Right above me is the date time stamp for Kiev right now live. And then my time is above that. The funds will come from existing U.S. stockpiles of weapons, allowing President Biden to send them directly without authorization from lawmakers. So we're sending them. Our, we're sending them U.S. stock. What weapons? 
A U.S. official speaking anonymously told Reuters the shipment is still being finalized and would probably include heavy ground artillery systems, including howitzers. Unnamed officials told the NBC the pack. Unnamed officials told NBC the package could include unmanned surface vehicles, sometimes called sea drones or drone ships and MI-17 helicopters. Another former official told the network the shipment would be a package that's built around the idea of larger scale combat and could potentially include short range anti ship missiles. We want Russia to lose. Oh shit, they do. The U.S. has provided $1.7 billion in security assistance to Ukraine since the invasion began. On Wednesday, Pentagon officials will hold a classified meeting with U.S. weapons and manufacturers amid a sharp rise in demand for weapons due to the war in Ukraine. According to Reuters, eight of America's largest arms companies will attend, including Rayathon, Lockheed Martin, which, will pro which produce Stinger and Javelin missiles. So we're sending we're sending them stockpiles of weapons, which will allow the president to circumvent lawmakers. So it doesn't have to go in the United States. It won't have to go through the House or the Senate, which is that's what that means. So we have the. So he'll be able to do that directly. How Ukraine. Excuse me, how AI is helping identify Ukraine's dead. A controversial facial recognition company, Clearview AI, announced that last month. Listen, listen. Hold on, hold on. All right. So as there's like as much as much support and and need that Ukraine is getting, right? And how much weapons and how much support that they're having to defend their country. There's still like I hope that, and I hope this, opinion time, this is my personal feelings, so if you don't feel this way, if you just want Ukraine to have it all, take it all, here, have all the, have all the technology, have all the weapons, you know, if that's what you feel, that's what you feel, but I'm, I'm hoping that there's somebody at some level that are, that is doing checks and balances, right? That's that's what our country is supposed to be about. The country of checks and balances to make sure things don't go extreme. Obviously, we know that doesn't work well in our country, unfortunately. But this is like I'm hoping that there is checks and balances for the technology that's being used, and because a lot of these companies are are open to giving it to them, so then they can do test. They're they're, they're testing them. They're testing their technologies. They're testing their uh, their weapons, like it's a uh, trial runs. They're doing trial runs of this shit over there. So as much as, as much defense, uh, that Ukraine is getting and how much they do need, I do hope that there is checks and balances. The, uh, the a controversial facial recognition company. So like just things that, and, and that for technology reasons, well, would, you know, impede on your personal, you know, and personal, uh, whatever they're, they're testing these technologies and, and you, Ukraine's just kind of letting them all in. And, uh, I'm really hoping that there is checks and balances for it. I don't know that for sure. Right now, Ukraine's just understandably, understandably, Ukraine is just focused on defending its country and repelling the Russian invasion. A hundred percent understood a hundred percent. You know, their, their, their main focus is, Hey, we got Russia on our heels. We need what we need. But with that being said, I still do hope that while this door is open to just giving Ukraine everything, right? We're just kind of giving them all of it right now, that there's someone still monitoring at the top or whatever. Um, so that, because right now, like Rayathon and Lockheed Martin and all of these weapons companies are like drooling right now. They're like drooling. They're 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 waiting to get in on this because it's it's uh, an it's an economy. Right now, it's privatized. It looks like they're using U.S. stockpiles for weapons and stockpiles, but and it's just I, I believe it's dangerous. Uh, in the long in the long run, is all I'm saying. Right. It's dangerous in the long run without checks and balances. At least 20 journalists have been killed in Ukraine since the beginning of the Russian invasion 
On 24th of February, the National Union of Journalists in Ukraine has reported on its Telegram channel. It published a list of their names that said these were the only deaths confirmed by the Prosecutor General's office. Some of them were foreigners, the union added. In his night, listen, yeah, we were in the Terminator was as much as it was a, as much as it was a science fiction. It, I mean, I'm starting to see that it was kind of a warning too. In his nightly address on the 48th day of war, President Vladimir Zelensky boasted of having captured the country's most senior pro-Russian politician, Viktor Medvedchuk, who was on the run suspected of treason. He announced Medvedchuk for his cynical wearing of military camouflage and his alleged attempt to escape prosecution. Well, if Medvedchuk chose a military uniform for himself, he falls under the rules of wartime, said Zelensky, going on to offer to exchange him with Russia for Ukrainians they are holding in captivity. Let Medvedchuk be an example for you, he continued. Even the former oligarch did not escape, not to mention more not to mention much more ordinary criminals from the Russian boondocks. We will get everyone, he said, adding that, quote, it is necessary to punish collaborators. So this is Medvedchuk. This is the pro-Russian opposition leader who has been suspected of treason. He was in Ukraine's government, but he was a pro-Russian opposition leader in Ukraine's government. Ukraine Security Services it has arrested the country's most senior pro-Russian politician, Viktor Medvedchuk. The opposition party leader had been under house arrest, suspected of treason, but fled shortly after the Russian invasion. President Zelensky offered Russia to trade him for captured Ukrainians. Earlier on Tuesday, he said that new mass graves are being discovered in formerly occupied areas, quote, almost daily. Russia and Ukraine are building up forces in the eastern region of Donbass. Satellite images show Russian troops and equipment in at least three places on Ukraine's border. Meanwhile, in Donbass, there are signs that Ukraine is bringing in more military equipment, although on a smaller scale. The U.S. cannot confirm unverified information that... Okay, so there's still unverified, if anybody's been wondering, on the chemical weapons, the, uh, the chemical weapons reports from two days ago. Maybe it was yesterday. The days blend. It was definitely within the last two days. Uh, it's still unverified. The U.S. hasn't confirmed it. There hasn't been any confirmation from the United Kingdom. Uh, nothing yet on the information that Russia used chemical weapons. U.S. deeply concerned at the report of Mariupol chemical attack. This was from 19 hours ago. The U.S. and Britain say they are looking in, into reports that the chemical weapons have been used by Russian forces attacking. Excuse me, let me read that again. The U.S. and Britain say they are looking into reports that chemical weapons have been used by Russian forces attacking the Ukrainian port of Mariupol. Ukraine's Azov regiment said that three soldiers were injured by a, quote, poisonous substance in an attack on Monday. However, no evidence has been presented to confirm the use of chemical weapons. UK Foreign Security Liz Trust said officials were working to urgently investigate what she called a callous escalation of the war. The Pentagon called the potential use of chemical weapons deeply concerning. Western nations have warned that the use of chemical weapons would mark a dangerous escalation of the war conflict and have pledged to take firm action if Russia carries out such attacks. Including United Kingdom said yesterday that all options are on the table if this is found to be a factual claim. Ukraine's Deputy Defense Minister Hannah Malar said the government was investigating the allegations, adding that early assumptions suggested phosphorus ammunition had been used. Phosphorus is not classed as a chemical weapon under the Chemical Weapons Convention, but using it as an incendiary weapon near civilians would be illegal. On Tuesday, pro-Russian separatist forces in Donetsk denied carrying out the attack. chemical forces. What's this about? The Azov Battalion, which has been heavily involved in fighting in Mariupol and has strong ties to the far right, wrote in Telegram post that Russian forces had dropped a poisonous substance of unknown origin during a drone attack at the city's large Azovstal metals plant. It said that the fighters had suffered minor injuries, including shortness of breath. So there was a assumption that it could have been a, a phosphorus ammunition been used. Which again isn't a it isn't a chemical weapon, but it's illegal to use in in war. 
It's against the Geneva Geneva Conventions. Super illegal. The Azov Battalion, which has been heavily involved in fighting in Mariupol, has strong. Sorry, I read that. It said that its fighters suffered minor injuries, including shortness of breath. One injured man described a sweet tasting white smoke covering an area of the plant after an explosion. Another said he felt immediately unable to breathe and had collapsed with cotton legs. The reported incident with the BBC cannot independently verify came hours after a spokesperson for Moscow backed Donetsk People's Republic urged Russia to bring, quote, chemical forces. So there is a video of Kadriov and the Chechen forces the day before this happened saying that they were going to they were urging Russia to bring in chemical chemical forces. And they were also threatening that they were going to take more. I mean, they were it's, to me in that video, they were posturing and they were they were just trying to amp. They were saying that we're going to take Kiev, We're going to take this city. We're going to continue on. I mean, they they tried Kiev, the Ru Russian forces tried Kiev and they couldn't take Kiev. And the uh, the Chechen forces certainly would not do that on their own. So a, lo a lot of it from the video the day prior feels to me like it was uh, amping from the Chechen forces, just, you know, making threats, uh, scaring people, uh, their scare tactics uh, with, with, uh, with through like propaganda, basically that type of propaganda would be like a blatant lie just to cause fear. Right. It's not like they were, they were doing Russian propaganda, which is like blatantly denying the exact thing that you're doing. Um, they were basically saying, driving fear but unconfirmed still then the next day after that video was made then this these uh these reports came out so that video was made and then the next day these reports came out and they're still unverified and that the ukraine's deputy defense minister said the government was investigating the allegations adding that early assumptions suggested phosphorus ammunition okay and is the latest on the uh, reported chemical weapons from Ukraine. All right, so this is our parents wouldn't leave Bucha, then Russia moved in. Le Lesia and Galia are sisters from Bucha. In mid-March, Lesia came to the Romanian border as her hometown was under siege. The last she heard, her parents were hiding in a basement, the same place where Galia and her daughters hid before fleeing the Romanian border. They wanted to protect their land and everything they owned, said Galia. We left the town two days after the shelling began, she said, but my parents stayed. Since then, she hadn't been able to contact them. Any attempts to reach them went unanswered, and Lesia and Galia feared the worst until one day the two sisters received a call. With Volkswagen, any choice is a smart choice. Yeah. More via so I watched this video and I was like, I couldn't even finish it. This is the neighbor. That's his house. And that's where the bomb or whatever it was. His house is here. My parents were here. And the bomb landed in the middle. I was like trying to call them, but there was no reply. Lesia and Galia are sisters from Bucha. In mid-March, Lesia came here to the Romanian border from London with her partner Adam, as her hometown was under siege. The last she heard, her parents were hiding in a basement, the same place where her sister Galia and her daughters hid before they fled here to the border. On Facebook, a lot of people are saying, can you please pick up my immobile mom or grandmother or there's children in the basement you don't know who's alive and who isn't and there's people on the street just dead people on the street finally they got a call their mom and dad were alive and forced to accept it was time to leave 
like thousands of others evacuating the suburbs around Kiev. But it's far from safe. It was two tense days before they got the message they were waiting for. They already on this side of the border, just waiting for us. Hmm. Still 20 minutes. She's saying that she doesn't miss her grandparents anymore. She misses her dad now. No, she knows that her grandparents are coming. Yep. It's hard to explain to kids as well that God knows when they're going to see I their do a dad. Call, so yeah, them. but it's not the same, is it? Yeah, they said they're somewhere in the building, but I haven't seen a building there. All good. <laughs> they, they got lucky. 40 years building and building and in one minute it's all gone. Because my dad actually builds the, the house that we lived in and the house that my sister lived in. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. My mom's like, I've been in this hat for 10 days without taking it off. <laughs> ah, nice is like, oh, when we are home, I will make you warm. We're just heading back in to meet Lesia's parents. Um, they've been in Romania about a day now and they've had a... I will say this, though, uh, the poll is intriguing for you guys. And a lot of us are from the United States in the chat, but there, there also is not. Keep in mind, in the United States, we have National Guard, we have reservists. Our country is built to prevent this. Like, we're already in a position where we would have, you know, they Ukraine had to establish that territorial defense force with civilians. Like, they, they had to do that pretty quickly and figure out, and then they have an international legion coming in. And in the United States, we have National Guard. We have those soldiers that serve in the National Guard, which is like the the uh, state's state-controlled uh, military. They go through the same, they're in the basic training with active duty military. They're receiving, I mean, they're not necessarily receiving the same, uh, you know, consistent training as active duty is just because it's a part-time job. But they go to basic training and receive that initial training with all of that, everybody that's serving active duty and they're with them the whole time. So the the part-time at-home soldiers that would be activated to prevent this from happening in the United States, they're they're trained and they're trained well. So keep that in mind. A chance to have a warm shower and a good sleep. So we're just gonna catch up with them and find out a bit more about their journey. The past two weeks, how have they been? Вот две недели мы там были в погребе, вот это на протяжении этих двух недель постоянные бомбежки. Света нет, газа нет, связи нет, еды, ну кто что запасся, вот такое вот было. Взяли белые. Australia has reservists too. I think. As Russian forces were pushed out of Bucha, Petro and Ludmila 
found out that their house is still standing, but it's been ransacked. Petro and Ludmila have gone to Portugal to be hosted by a couple that they'd never met before. Galia and her daughters are taking refuge in the UK with Lesia and Adam and trying to avoid reading too much news from home. Wow. The White House releases a transcript of Biden's genocide remarks. The White House he has sent out a transcript of Biden's follow-up remarks about his earlier comments on genocide. Biden was asked to comment shortly afterwards aborted Air Force One for takeoff from Des Moines International Airport. Here's what he said. Yes, I called it a genocide. It's become clearer and clearer that Putin is just trying to wipe out the idea of even being being able to be Ukrainian. And the amount the amount of evidence is mounting. It's different than it was last week. The more evidence coming out of the, excuse me, the more evidence is coming out of the, literally, the horrible things that the Russians have done in Ukraine. And we're going to only learn more and more of the devastation. And we'll, and we'll let the lawmakers decide internationally whether or not it qualifies, but it sure seems that way to me. Now let's go to the list. Let's look up the, this is, oh, that's from the subway shooting that we went over earlier. Let's look at John, update from John Sweeney. Old BBC reporter. Now independent in Kiev. He's been providing daily updates and diary posts. You guys can follow him on Twitter to support his work. And then he has a Patreon and all that. So John Sweeney with his lucky orange hat. Spam the orange, the lucky orange hats in the chat. Kiev diary, day 48 of Vladimir <clears throat> Putin's war. The Russians appoint a new general to command the war in the south. His name is Vornikov, and he is the butcher of Aleppo. Last night, Ukrainians fighting in besieged and encircled Maripol suspect that poison gas chemical weapons was used sarin it's impossible to confirm it because Maripol is closed apart from this sort of tiny band of heroic Ukrainian fighters I believe I believe them because it fits a pattern the pattern goes back to something very early on, nothing to do with Vonikov, but with the childhood of Vladimir Putin. He describes when he's brought up dirt poor um, in a really grim flat in poor Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, as tons of rats. He, they used to, him and his mates used to hunt them with sticks, and then once the, uh, the rat gets cornered, and the rat goes for him, and he runs to his flat and slams the door on the rat's snout. And it struck me actually that hitting rats with sticks is not an efficient way to kill the vermin. The best way, of course, is rat poison. Now, it's not in Putin's ghosted um, autobiography, First Person, but I believe that Vladimir Putin has been obsessed with poison and poisoning his enemies his whole life and it started from when he used rat poison as a boy there's more of this in my podcast taking on putin which tries to get inside his head as best we can from kiev lots of love John Sweeney, one more time, if you just started watching now and missed it. Kiev diary, day 48 of Vladimir Putin's war. 
The Russians appoint a new general to command the war in the south. His name is Vornikov, and he is the butcher of Aleppo. Last night, Ukrainians fighting in besieged and encircled Mariupol suspect that poison gas, chemical weapons, was used. Sarin. It's impossible to confirm it because Mariupol is closed apart from this sort of tiny band of heroic Ukrainian fighters. I believe, I believe them because it fits a pattern. The pattern goes back to something very early on, nothing to do with Volikov, but with the childhood of Vladimir Putin. He describes when he's brought up dirt poor um, in a really grim flat in poor Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. As tons of rats, he, they used to, him and his mates used to hunt them with sticks and then once the, uh, the rat gets cornered and the rat goes for him and he runs to his flat and slams the door on the rat's snout. And it struck me actually that hitting rats with sticks is not an efficient way to kill the vermin. The best way, of course, is rat poison. Now, it's not in Putin's ghosted um, autobiography, First Person. But I believe that Vladimir Putin has been obsessed with poison and poisoning his enemies his whole life. And it started from when he used rat poison as a boy. There's more of this in my podcast, Taking on Putin, which tries to get inside his head as best we can. From Kiev. Lots of love. All right, that's John. Let's look at Rob now for the combat footage. Anything combat related that happened today? Let me see, five hours ago. Let me see, let's just keep going. Let's just go back. Six hours ago. All right, let's just start at the top and then work our way down. We don't have clips and video coming out at an instantaneous rate now so i'll let you know how many hours ago i don't cover things that happened days and days and days ago unless it's relevant to the current or if there's like a an update to the story and then you guys need to see the the old video to understand the current one or an old clip to understand what's going on now so even though this isn't recent within the last few hours it's still six hours ago this was posted Video of Russian artillery and possibly airstrikes in Mariupol near the port and DNR BMPs with an added side armor. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <clears throat> I meant Rob Lee, so there's a couple of Robs that we use. We use Rob Turkula from Speak the Truth, and then this is Rob Lee's uh, Twitter account. He's a PhD student, War Studies. He was in the Marine Corps. And he's got a whole bunch of credit credits that I don't have. So he's done a lot more shit than me, but he's he's really good at at sourcing these. And then we've been using his sources. And that explosion initially. So look right here if you missed it. If you're looking around trying to find it. Right here. Right above the O in Rudenko. <laughs> Also, new task and purpose, yes. Task and purpose uploaded a new video. Here's a captured T-80 BV tank in Ezium. Possibly from the 4th Tank Division. So this is from Ezium. That's in here, right here. The first city in the... If you're looking at the Ukraine war map, the live UA map, it's the first city inside of Russian territory here. Here's Ezium. A 
Low flying Russian SU twenty five SM three aircraft. Location unknown. Just a video of some a Russian SU twenty five S aircraft. Likely gonna be loud, so I'm gonna turn it down. If you guys are looking to help for sourcing videos and other things, please join our Discord server. Here, how do I pull this up here? Join our, our Discord. I need to... Bang. Here's what our server looks like. An awesome Discord server you can find in the description of the video. And I've reworked the, the server now to have a whole menu for Ukraine war uh, discussions. So you guys can chat about the war. Video clips are in here sharing all all clips that are coming out so we can pull that up and i'm going to actually go through this too in our server and use our server as a source and then and there's the not safe for work uh graphic page for anything that we can't cover on the feed and video clips uh, like war crimes and and other things again and it's not safe for work graphic channel and then there's just general links to news stories and updates about the war in Ukraine here, <clears throat> and then the uh, you know, uh, a relief channel as well. You guys can see in our server. So plenty of content on our server at all times going on. Let's just go through the video clips coming out here. We'll scroll up in our server. Shout out to our server for sourcing all this stuff. But definitely join this if you have not done so. Heavy, heavy Russia. This is about the heavy military equipment being sent to the Polish border from the Russian side. No, nope. I'd have to go to the source. It's being a pain. You like the new Discord look? Perfect. Join our server. <clears throat> There's 506 likes out of a thousand. You guys are doing great. All right. If you don't have a source, it's okay. I can pull up the video, or I can pull up our server now on the feed. I figured it out. This is video of Russian strikes on from the Kharkiv region on April 8th. It looks like a Tornado S MLRS rocket with a parachute. This is from Rob Lee. And again, this stuff is all found in our server. You can see the explosions in the back. Oh my goodness. No audio in this clip. Big one in the, in the foreground. All right, one more. Come on. So it's stri one strike in the back and then it hits right here in the foreground. You join Discord, you need to figure it out. All of the, It's all on the left side. All the, the menus and the channels are on the left side. You need to swipe. there. It, it, so it hit right there. I missed it. Right here. You can see it hit the ground. There, it's in the air kind of still. Right there.
This is at, it looks like the Tornado S with a parachute in Kharkiv. That's in the Kharkiv region. Rescuers are going through the ruins of an apartment building destroyed by a Russian bomb in early March in Borodyanka, northwest of Kiev, on April 12th. Four bodies have already been uncovered at this site, and the works continue. Right from the key, oh, can I be played? This is at the apartment in Borod Borodyanka. This video is buffered better in Discord. They do it. A, they do it. And it's at a distance. <clears throat> Let's just go to the source here. These are all in our Discord server. I'm just having, for some reason, it's having issues. All right. Let's pull this up quick. Switch it over. Oops. Uh, I'll have a smoother transition for that next stream <clears throat> to go from Discord to Twitter list. I'll have a smoother transition, promise. Here's the video I was trying to play for you guys in our Discord. Read it one more time. This is rescuers are going through the ruins of an apartment building destroyed by a Russian bomb in early March in Borodyanka, northwest of Kiev on April 12th. Four bodies have already been uncovered at this site and the works continue. So, <clears throat> all right, hold on. A couple things, y'all. Hey, the more y'all talk about people that are trolling, the more that they're going to do it or, like, bring more people. Hey, look, y'all, we can trigger the chat. Like, listen, hey, all it takes, watch, right? Do this. Oh, now the chat's gone. Oh, but the stream's still going. You guys can watch the stream and, like, put the chat away for a little bit if it's bothering you. But I promise you guys, the more you call attention to it and the more that you talk about it the more of them that will come and they'll continue annoying you why no facebook tonight there's no no more facebook for youtube streams for these ones all right so these type of streams where we're going over all of the news and it's this stream is gonna be about three four hours long it'll be on youtube only for streams that i am like a press conference <clears throat> or something that i can go live and it's not going to be too long so like most of my in-person streams unless it's like a major event and i'm out there for hours like i have been in the past uh i will go live on facebook th for that and then at, at youtube at night for these type of streams i will use my facebook stream that i did and then talk about it on youtube so facebook is still going to be a thing i just it's too much to go to live on both platforms to do this type of a stream where we're going over th the world news so it's YouTube, the Timberwolves won, let's go. I don't, I haven't been able to keep up on the sports. Timberwolves clinch three minutes ago. Hey, let's, let's go. Timberwolves are in the playoffs if you care about sports. Minnesota, Minnesota fans, we haven't been, dude. We don't, the Timberwolves, are, our basketball team doesn't make the playoffs often. So that's just a little sports news. The Timberwolves won the play-in. Let's go, dude. 109 to 104. Wolves over the Clippers, really quick. Sorry, I got it. I love Minnesota sports. We don't get we don't get uh, good news often. So, all right, I had, to, I had to do that real quick. I just seen that come across my screen. But uh, back to back to the the news. Uh, so, like when I'm doing a press conference or when I'm at a, a report, you know, where I'm out there, I will do that on Facebook. And then for the nighttime YouTube streams. 
like while I'm sitting here, I'll say, all right, guys, this was, this is what I did today. And then I'll pull up the Facebook live that I did and then talk about it on YouTube. I just, these long, these long form streams are are just not good for Facebook for some reason. So I hope you guys understand. And also if you're a supporter of the Facebook page, like if you're a, a monthly supporter, I will do a 30, uh, 30 minutes prior to this stream every night. I do a supporter only discussion stream on Facebook. All right. So those that are, that have been supporting and have been watching over there, I'm still doing plenty of content for you. And we also post daily, like all these clips that we're going through. A lot of them do get posted and shared and lots of news gets posted there. <clears throat> YouTube's just a video platform. So this type of a, this type of content's better for YouTube. All right, let's continue on. Yeah, and this is our Discord server. Join our Discord to see see this news. So Putin commands on, excuse me, Putin comments on Ukraine's accusations of war crimes and other atrocities against civilians in towns Russia occupied. He goes on about Afghanistan and Syria for a bit, but then claims are fake. But then says the claims are fake. There's no translation there, but Putin speaking. Putin dragged Lukashenko to a cosmodrome in far eastern Russia for this. He claims he has secret information about how mysterious Englishmen staged a provocation in Bucha. So they're denying staged a provocation. Sounds like Bucha has indeed detailed peace talks after promising sings in Istanbul. This is this is translated. And so Putin and uh, Putin and Lukashenko spoke today in a cosmodrome in far eastern Russia. So there's no translation, so you can't really see what they're saying at all. Putin says the West sanctions blitzkrieg against Russia has failed thanks to central bank measures to stabilize the economy. Your blitzkrieg failed. <laughs> wow. This is more evidence Putin was planning a blitzkrieg of his own. What do you mean planning? He were, they tried it and failed. They tried to blitzkrieg Kiev and failed. Peskov asked Lukashenko if he wants to go to space. I would like to. I used to think my older brother Putin might send me there and not bring me back. Now I don't think so anymore. So they did a press conference. What is this here? Let's pull this up. Added subs for anybody that's interested. Hold on. This is... Okay. Let's pull this up. Putin speaking today on his main justifications for invading Ukraine. So Putin's justifications for the war in Ukraine, the main goal is to help people. We were forced to do it. We couldn't put up with it any longer. A clash was inevitable. It was just a matter of time. We didn't have a choice. This was the right thing to do. And then they, where's the... Thank you. Added subs. So he, this, this has subtitles so we can listen to his words. Отказались прямо публично же они заявили. Президент сказал, что ни один пункт этого соглашения не нравится. Другие официальные лица заявили, что имплементация этих договоренностей невозможно, это развалит страну. Они публично от этого отказались. Но продолжать даже терпеть этот геноцид в течение продолжавшийся в течение 8 лет просто невозможно. Это первое, а второе Украину начали превращать в плацдарм, к сожалению, для нас плацдарм антироссийский. Начали выращивать там имевшиеся уже давно раски национализма и неонацизма. Вы знаете, если вы обратили внимание, я сказал об этом в одном из своих публичных обращений. С 
специально выращивали вот так вот эту порцию неонацистскую. И столкновение с этими силами для России было неизбежно. Они только выбирали время для, для атаки. Ну, а последующие события показали, насколько глубоко это все там проросло. Это очевидный факт. Это, этот неонацизм, к сожалению, он стал фактом жизни достаточно большой и близкой нам страны. Вот это очевидная вещь. Это было неизбежно. Вопрос был только во времени. И то, что мы делаем, помогая людям, спасая их от нацида, с одной стороны, а с другой стороны, предпринимая меры обеспечения безопасности самой России, очевидно, что другого выбора у нас не было. Это правильный шаг. И то, что цели будут достигнуты, нет никаких сомнений. That was Putin today, speaking with some translation. Let's go to the list. Join our Discord server too, y'all, if you have not done so. The U.S. rights report significant human rights abuses committed by Russia in Crimea. A State Department report cited a range of human rights abuses from unlawful or arbitrary killings and to torture, to gating treatment of Russia or Russia-led authorities. Let's pull up a couple... What is it? Um, shoot. What was the what was the other channel that we watched? We watched Speak the Truth. Was it Task and Purpose? Is that the other channel? I think it's Task and Purpose. Uploaded a new video. Task and Purpose. Yes, that's the one. Welcome back to Task. All right. So talk about the NLA's use in Ukraine, why every military needs the NLA anti-tank missile. This is an informative video about the NLA next generation anti-tank system. It uses a predictive guidance system to track enemy tanks and lock onto them. So this is like some, we, we watched Task and Purpose on their last video. This is a little more informative video on the, the, the NLA. How does it feel that the tables have turned? World War II soldiers, historically since World War II, soldiers have preferred to travel the battlefield within the safety of an armored vehicle, but all that is changing now. And I've been asking this. I've been asking the some veterans in the chat about, I mean, this is what y'all rolled into, y'all in 2003 that served in the military. This is what you guys were in, no armor. But now, even with all the armor in the world, I mean, the Barakdar drone is just taking vehicles out, and then soldiers on the ground with their shoulder-fired rockets are just taking vehicles out on their own. Interesting. Let's see what he has to say. This is task and purpose on on YouTube on the anti on the NLA anti-tank missile that we've been seeing frequent use in Ukraine. Welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. The next generation light anti-tank weapon or N-Law was so effective that it caught us completely by surprise. Historically, since World War II, soldiers have preferred to travel the battlefield within the safety of an armored vehicle. But all mm. that's changing now as tanks are becoming giant sitting ducks. How does it feel now that the tables have turned? The hunter has become the hunted. But mm. why is this launcher an order of magnitude more effective compared to the old RPG? What makes it so unique? And what are its potential downsides that people aren't really talking about? Well, lock on to the like and subscribe button if you enjoy this video. Let's move out. The weapon was developed by Saab as a single soldier, short range, easy to fire system to counter enemy armored threats. The development of the N law began way back in 1999 when the British and Swedish authorities signed a memorandum of understanding together. That's basically a weapons bro code. The plan was to create a shoulder fired, lightweight, portable anti tank system that could be fired from indoors and auto track the enemy target. Firing from inside confined spaces might not seem like a big deal, but most anti-tank systems in the past were unable to do this because of the deadly backblast from firing them, which could injure anyone standing up to 65 meters behind you. Dang. So the technology to fire this from indoors makes it especially useful. Backblast area clear. Useful for modern urban warfare. This makes the N-Law almost as dangerous as my N-Laws that I have to argue with every Christmas dinner. <laughs> That's okay, I'll see myself. Using a predictive line of sight software to track the enemy target is completely novel to this system. It's based on a missile from an old system that they developed. At the time, you gotta remember, this type of weapon didn't exist. The closest thing was this 
Saab had this what? heavy, massive, non-portable, wire-guided RBS-56 build, which had a missile that would auto-detonate when it detected a nearby target. Saab used that weapon as a jumping off point to run a test which was successful, and it got them the go-ahead from the UK to continue work in 2002. They weren't able to make the warhead tandem because that would be too big, too massive to carry around. Tandem means that the missile would explode twice and defeat explosive reactive armor. Instead, they went with an improved warhead that incorporates a dynamically compensated shaped and copper line charge that would explode just once and still guarantee a one hit kill and be small enough to be man portable. Most of the design work was carried out in Sweden and the manufacturing was done in Britain. It took almost 10 years of trial and error before the NLAW went into full production. The NLAW is a third generation anti tank weapon system. My understanding is that the way the generations work is that the first generation are your World War II era anti-tank system. So think about your tube launchers that just fire and then you run away. The, M the M2 bazooka. The second generation is wire guided and the third generation systems rely on laser or IR seekers attached to the nose of the missile. So wow. Rafael Hidalgo Alveri wrote an excellent paper about the production history of the NLAW where he interviewed several employees from Saab, and he got one example of how their teams function internally. So they share information across departments in the anti-tank weapon system teams, so that they're able to take bits and pieces that they learn from past weapons like the Carl Gustav and apply it to the NLAW. He gave an example of one 72-year-old employee that was working at Saab who was responsible for inventing the missile guidance principle because he was inspired by other systems at Saab. He's known as a guru within the company who has a solid reputation He's able to back any weapon system by just saying it's simply good to go. A 2008 audit paper from the Minister of Defense talked about how the teams failed an internal 2006 design qualification test in November 2006. They needed to reduce how long it took to train on the system. And according to their own analysis, there was no armored threat in NATO at the time. So delaying a few years wouldn't disrupt current operations. So why wasn't Russia working on a similar system at the same time? I think the reason Russia and China don't have any advanced third generation weapons technology like this that's on par with the Javelin or the Enlaw is because it took cooperation from countries across the entire globe to make something as revolutionary as the Enlaw. So NATO, NATO worked together to build that thing. For instance, the missile's inertia system, the measurement unit, is manufactured by BAE Systems at Plymouth, Massachusetts. They then created a whole entire new semiconductor facility for mass production in Japan. Japan created the silicon rate sensors that are in the missile. 14 different subcontractors in the UK were required for the manufacturing of the weapon. It took resources and specialized skills in engineering that cannot be found in one or two countries. Nothing brings countries together like the shared vision for an awesome defensive weapon like the NLAW. The final assembly was completed at Thales Air defense in the UK. Once the system got approval in 2008, they created well over 20,000 units of the NLAW so far, and each one has about a unit cost of around $40,000, which yeah, it might sound expensive, but it's far cheaper than the cost of a tank, and it's way cheaper than the $200,000 Javelin system. Yeah, $40,000 for that? I mean, again, that does sound like a big cost, but in comparison to other spending and military equipment, for sure. This costs $40,000, but there's still styrofoam pieces all over it. That's where the British military and Saab decided to skimp out. It's like getting one of those McMansion houses made out of cardboard. Now, of course, the real reason they made it out of styrofoam is probably to keep the weight down. The whole concept of the end law is a lot like the David versus Goliath story, where the end law allows a regular, lowly, average soldier with less than an hour of training to- Chemical weapons in Russia are unverified. Take out a $2 million- oh, Excuse me, sorry. Chemical weapons in Mariupol are unverified. Ukrainian Army Staff Sergeant Roman Yeremenko, 28 years old, predicted how useful the weapon would be a full two weeks prior to the Russian Army's invasion of his country when he said, quote, technically they are brilliant missiles. As before, we only had RPGs. These weapons are absolutely a game changer for us. It's as if they have a brain. You can fire and forget them from buildings and trenches, and you can also target hidden tanks. Wow, so we actually made a next generation weapon that works? 
So what are the actual specifications for the N-Law weapon? And what sets it apart from other AT systems? The N-Law weighs 28 pounds and is just over three feet long. It comes preloaded inside the tube, so there's no need for setting it up or assembling it like IKEA furniture. No, it comes ready to rock. That's kind of one downside to the weapon though, because once you fire it, you have to ditch it. Unlike other anti-tank systems like the RPG, which are much lighter weight and can be reloaded, so it's a trade-off. The actual projectile's diameter for the N-Law pretty massive at 150 millimeters. For reference, that's about the size of an artillery shell. This wow. is why the missile undoubtedly destroys armor. With the RPG, you have to cross your fingers that it's going to penetrate the tank. Saab has boasted that their munition can penetrate any modern tank armor, even ones fitted with the Russian reactive armor. Another key piece as to why this system is special is that it comes with a 2.5 magnified optical sight with night vision. This night vision is better nice. than what most enemy tanks have, so it gives troops a huge advantage. The max effective range for engaging targets is 800 meters. However, that drops to 400 meters when you're aiming at moving targets. This means you have to be up close with the N-Law compared to the Javelin, which can be a drawback. Javelin thermal guided system for reference can do 2000 meters range. Commander, they're firing in-laws at us. No, not my in-laws. What are they doing here? <sighs> We already did this joke, it wasn't funny the first time. Enlaw's <laughs> actual missile warhead is high explosive anti-tank ammunition and has a special ability compared to other similar rounds that the RPG fires. It is proximity trigger, which means that it will sense when it's over the enemy target about a meter above and automatically explode at that point. This takes a lot of human error out of the marksmanship equation. So with the RPG, you're constantly missing. With this, that doesn't really happen. I mean, and anybody that's played, I mean, the RPG is tough to use. Anybody that's used it in real life or even just, um, shit, in Battlefield or if you play Call of Duty or whatever the hell, that R the RPG is tough. You gotta be super close because the thing fires, it goes, shh, 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 just goes. You don't even know where it's going. They say it's idiot proof, but I'll be the judge of that. Saab developed the system software, which has what's called a fine-tuned predictive line of sight tool. This is the heart of what makes the N-Law unique from old anti-tank second generation weapons. The guidance system works by having the computer targeting system predict the enemy's location instead of locking on using a thermal signature like the Javelin does. The way it works is the gunner views the enemy tank for three seconds, then the guidance package records the movements and calculates both the distance to wow. the target and the the target's speed. If it's moving, then the missile guides itself, actually moves as it's on the way to the target, thanks to the computer predicted location. Jeez, dude, that thing has more to, that thing has more to it than I thought it did. So it has an AI that, or a, a program that will map out, project where the vehicle's moving, or if it's a moving target, and then account for that and calculate. Wow. The Enlaw missile makes any and all corrections according to the data that was acquired during the initial tracking phase from the gunner. Once the missile's left the tube, the gunner doesn't have to continue tracking the target. They can just fire and forget. The munition flies at about 400 miles per hour and can penetrate up to 20 inches of enemy armor, which is overkill for most modern tanks. Jeez, when it comes to dude. moving targets, the missile guidance system extrapolates the movement of the target, predicts the position of them, and then it corrects the flight path and route to the target. So the sensor on the missile is actually analyzing the target once it goes overhead and instantaneously did he just did he include arma 3 <laughs> was that arma he did that for the memes overhead and instantaneously actually analyzing the target once it goes over flight path and route to the target so the sensor this is arma this is a, this is a video game on the missile is actually analyzing the target once it goes overhead and instantaneously it's matching the known target against this target that it sees so that the warhead will only detonate if it's over a tank. The missile successfully wow. activates if the target is partially concealed, like when the Russians are trying to fool the end law with all those cope cages that they ghetto rigged on top of their <laughs> The cope cage. The vast amount of copium that the Russian forces had to, to take. They call they calls them the cope cages. <laughs> tanks in Ukraine. So you might be wondering how the N-Law can determine when to explode. It uses magnetic and optical sensors on the munition to detect the instant that it's over the enemy target. This is useful for its overfly top attack mode when it flies one meter above the line of sight and triggers its explosion on top of the armor, which is usually the tank's weakest point. You don't need to be able to see the entire tank, only a small portion of the target needs to be visible. So technically this could work against targets that are dug in and hidden behind dirt berms and defense 
defensive structures. The T-72 is especially vulnerable to these kind of attacks against yeah. the turret. Have you ever oh. noticed when you see a, a Russian tank knocked out, the turret is usually blown off? This is because the T-72 and earlier Russian tanks, they store their ammo magazine and their extra tank shells inside the turret due to the autoloader that Russian tanks use. Which we've gone over. That's why people have asked, why, why is the the top blown off the tanks why is all the 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 cannon and then the you know why is it blown off why is the top blown off because of the auto loaders and they're hitting them and then they blow up the whole top the top comes right off it means that the crew doesn't have to manually load their ammo but the trade-off is that the ammo isn't confined in safe racks so it's not behind blast doors when it explodes it's usually a catastrophic event for the entire crew. The American Damn. M1 Abrams, on the other hand, has the ammo stored in an armored magazine behind an armored door, which- And you got a good old, you got a 19 year old private in there loading the thing. You got a soldier in there, the lo manually loading it. Strong, young, young private. Prevents the ammo from blowing up when there's a fire inside the turret. The end law gunner has to choose whether to use top attack or direct attack mode by pressing a button. In direct attack, the missile fuse system is disconnected and the warhead simply detonates when it impacts with the target after a short delay. So it can be used against helicopters or buildings in this direct attack mode. So why did this weapon's success surprise us so much? It seemed like it came out of nowhere, but there was early evidence of how effective it was gonna be. Found an old live fire test report published by Saab in April of 2014, where they reported that the NLAW brand new gunners were engaging targets in bad weather conditions, and they were still hitting the test targets well beyond the recommended distance. Johan Ekrud, product manager for the NLAW, said, quote, these firing tests highlight performance beyond the NLAW was originally specified for, and the results really do show the system's outstanding capability. Keep in mind, April of 2014, when this happened, is only about two months after Russia had annexed Crimea. So it's possible that this weapon wasn't really factored into their plans when they invaded Ukraine in 2022. They didn't account for how much the end law would be able to make a huge difference against their armor. So for instance, to date, NATO has supplied 10,000 of these to Ukraine by March 9th, 2022. Everybody had only one. 3% of those hit their target, that's 300 destroyed Russian tanks. Some weapons have to wait a while before they're battle tested, but in the grand scheme of things, the NLAW was barely off the assembly line before being put to test. Wow. It barely built a reputation for the armies that it was made for. I think British generals are breathing a huge sigh of relief now over the fact that they spent millions of dollars on a new weapon that actually works didn't i just say that didn't i just touch on that i mean it's good it's good that ukraine's getting the defense they need to defend their country but people are sending like uh weapons over there that haven't been tested or like they're testing shit through the war here here here's this, here's this weapon system and then the the weapons system company or whatever government like sits back and sees how it op sees how it works and then they see if they the funding will go to it Nah, they haven't battle tested this. Not always the case for military higher up. The internet is littered with videos and pictures of wrecked Russian tanks and other armored yeah. vehicles crediting the end law. I don't think humanity has seen such a new product get so much praise since forever. When interviewed, Lieutenant Colonel Bavetsky of Ukraine said, God save the queen, the end law is a game changer. Thank you to Great Britain for giving us the end law. Anything that helps us defend our country is very well received. These missiles have changed the war for us. It means we can fight the Russians and it doesn't matter how many of them there are now that we have a way of stopping their armor. The Russians cannot scare us with numbers anymore. There is evidence that- Like what weapons? The N-Law, for one. We're watching the whole, the whole videos about it. These kind of weapons have fallen into the- New tech. New, a way to test new technology in war. ...hands of the Russian military. We're yet to see if they're able to actually duplicate the weapon systems in any meaningful way. They might be too expensive and complicated for the Russian military industrial complex to reverse engineer and handle. The Russian army doesn't really have any third generation AT weapons currently. And if they're able to successfully reverse engineer the Enlaw and the Javelin, that would be bad news for NATO armor. So the Enlaw was kind of a weapon that the British wanted as a secondary anti-tank weapon to the Javelin, but it turns out really kicks ass. There are some disadvantages, mainly it doesn't have the type of range as a typical AT missile, and it's quite expensive. We will see how this weapon will affect the outcome of future wars. Maybe it'll make tanks obsolete. Let us know what you think in the comments. Did I miss anything about the end law? I'm Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching Task. At Task and Purpose, go we'll like and sub to that channel. We've used a couple of their videos now. Now let's listen to Rob Turkla from Speak the Truth, who's actually been in our feed a couple times. Our, our, our channel, our chat, go support the channel. And he provides military information, 
and movements and map updates. Looks like he's in a different location today. I'm not seeing. Oh, there, there are some map updates. All right, Rob Turkle from Speak the Truth. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're actually going to overlay some footage of exactly where I'm sitting right now. It is quite, quite pretty. I'm actually out here fishing. This is the first time I've actually filmed one of these videos without a hat on as well. A little strange yeah. deal going on. Hey, I want to start this video off with something that I found to be a little hilarious. It has nothing to do with anything we're going to talk about today. I just wanted to start this thing off on the right foot. Feet up, Court. Two hands, two hands. Go, 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 girl. <laughs> Don't let go. Dad. Oh, so if you guys are new to the channel, red is going to be Russia. In <laughs> what? Do I need to start my streams off with a, a funny video too? Just to get the move. <laughs> what? <laughs> Blue is going to be Ukraine. All right. Ukraine. So here's the map currently. So just so you guys are aware, we did make some adjustments. There hasn't been a lot going on when it comes to uh, ground taken by. Uh, that, threw, that was so random. That just threw me off. Hold on. Hold on. That was so random. All right. Start it. Start it off again. All right. It was going to be Ukraine. So here's the map currently. So just so you guys are aware, we did make some adjustments. There hasn't been a lot going on when it comes to uh, ground taken by either side. There is a ton going on in the world when it has to do with this conflict throughout the gate. So the Donetsk People's Militia has stated that port inside of Mariupol has now fully been secured. Resistance is limited to industrial zones. They said that there will be a decision on how to smoke them out. So this was actually stated about 18 hours ago. And six hours later, it has actually been said that Russian forces have actually used a chemical weapon of some sort in, in, in this area. And it's been distributed by a drone. Okay, I know you guys have probably read this a few separate times. Victims have apparently had shortness of breath, nausea, and vomiting. They believe sarin was actually used, the chemical that was used, and it was actually delivered by a drone. Apparently, it's been exploding drone of some sort. I don't exactly know, but it is not confirmed yet. So U.S. officials have actually stated they're taking it very, very slow to confirm if this chemical weapon was actually used because it would change how they handle this war drastically. Clearly, it's, it's, that's going to be the case. They stated that if they were to use chemical weapons, it would change the entire conflict as a whole. And I, I'm fairly somewhat skeptical that it was actually used. I'm not saying that that's not the case. I'm not going to say that's not the case. I'm just saying it's coming from the Azaz and they've had a little bit of trouble. We're going to talk about here later on. I think the timing of it is very strange. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what has to come out. I'm not saying that it didn't happen, but the timing is a little bit skeptical, which we will talk about here in a second. Agreed. Because again, three things like it's coming from the, the, the Azov, right? It's coming from them. Uh, it's been unverified. The United States, the United Kingdom, the intelligence it's, hasn't verified it at all. They're still working. They're taking the threat seriously. The president of Ukraine is taking it seriously. Everybody's taking the claim seriously, but yet the reports are still unconfirmed. The timing is interesting for two reasons. One being the city of Mariupol is under siege. I mean, they're surrounded completely. It's a dire situation. Uh, it's not looking good. Two, the Chechen forces, Kadriov's forces, the day before put out a video saying that they were gonna that they they were urging Russia to use chemical weapons uh, in Ukraine, and then also were fear mongering, saying that they were gonna take Kiev and they were gonna take Kharkiv and they were gonna take other cities and then move on into other countries. So, I mean, a lot of that in my a lot of that to me felt like and sounded like posturing and you know fear mongering and they're just trying to amp the chechen forces and then the next day is when the azov battalion put out that there had been chemical uh weapons use in mariupol and then you know that's been unverified but yet the ukrainian minute the uh, ukrainian official had came out and said that they believed early reports that it could be white phosphorus which isn't a chemical weapon yet it is illegal to use in war. Okay. So let's see what Rob says. I haven't seen this. And again, if you're new to the channel, I re I react to everything that we go through live with you guys. I, if I see something that I want to watch on stream through like watching YouTube or whatever, I'll pause and then save it for the stream. So this is Rob Turkle. Speak the truth. This is also kind of wild. The video you're about to see is apparently of the Russian forces who are beginning to move heavy equipment towards the Gulf of Finland and the Finnish border. That's the other thing too we need to like keep tabs on. Please join our server is the Russian movement towards the border. Um they're moving equipment. They're moving equipment up here to the Finnish bo the border with Finland. We need, like we need to move the map up here. Uh 
and because Finland and Sweden are slated to join NATO. All right. The countries are going to join NATO and Russia has already put out like, Hey y'all, yo, anybody that joins NATO, we got beef, right? We have problems. Russia's putting out that NATO is the NATO's evil. And anybody that joins NATO is an enemy. So they're moving, they're moving troops along the Finnish border. Also, NATO had just announced they were deploying two multinational naval groups consisting of 16 ships to the Baltic Sea to reassure allies in the Baltic region over the next week. It's also... Yo, I mean, there's just so much like happening that like this is why I don't I do not sleep after these streams until like four in the morning, y'all. It's just too much, too much. We didn't take the last uh, from 2014 to 2022 seriously in terms of what Russia was doing and the the geopolitical moves being made that's been going on. And now it's like you're seeing Russian the Russians moving on the Finnish border. Uh, Finland and Sweden want to join NATO, so then they get the NATO defense. Russia's already put out that anybody that joins NATO, it's about like it's on site. Like if you join NATO, it's on site. Like Ukraine's trying to join NATO, and look what's happening. Or Ukraine's trying to be a part of the defense alliance and be a part and be a Western, be a more westernized country. And you see what happens. You saw you saw what they did, right? This is like this is like brewing, y'all. In my opinion, and how I feel of the situation is it's brewing right now, like a, a mass, a, a bigger, a bigger conflict outside of Ukraine and Russia is is brewing from that. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. It's what it's what we're seeing. It's it's what my my gut is seeing. We're seeing this happen live. It's been confirmed. They're not live, but we're seeing this every day. Every day, something new is happening on the in the global scale from the the effects of this war. So there was a Russian ammo depot that I thought was hit. I wasn't going to tell you guys about it yesterday, but now it's one hundred percent confirmed, and it was hit in Donbas. And here's the video to show you guys the extensive damage that was done to this area it's it's pretty bad try to be as positive as we can though you know what i mean you gotta be as positive as we can but there's definitely moves being made I mean, and i don't know this it's out of our control all we can do is react to it it's not like i'm gonna say something and then like things are gonna change or anything it's like we really can just we have to see what happens i don't i don't really provide analysis on what i think is going to happen in the future because why I don't I don't have the education for it and I'm just understanding it or starting to learn it now. But all I know for sure is that these moves that are being made, it's shit's brewing. We don't have it's we've been watching it for over, almost 50 days now just in Ukraine, but the moves outside of Ukraine in the NATO countries, it's getting it's getting there. So this video you guys are about to see is coming out of the town of Matviv Kurgan, which is actually, I'm showing you here on Google, but there it is right there. As you guys can see, it's just on the, the outskirts of Donetsk. It's actually inside of Russia itself. So the Russian BTGs as a whole right now, it's been rendered combat ineffective in the Ukraine is a bit higher than previously thought. I think we talked about this a couple days ago. I think it was, I, I stated it was roughly like 25 to 30. Well, now it's came out that it's been reassessed. It's now 37 to 38, which leaves about 90 of them operational. That is fairly large still, 90 operational. This suggests that Russia has to sustain heavier losses than what has been actually anticipated. I think we this is pretty fairly common knowledge when they've been actually recruiting from Syria and all over from the far west side of Russia, and they're bringing in another 60,000 reservists. We know that this is to be the case, but this is just want to let you guys know. Now it's reassessed to about 37 to 38, and each BTG is going to consist of roughly about 700 to 1,000 men. 
So that's not saying the entire thing has been taken out. It's just combat ineffective op and non-operational. You're looking at probably 40 to 50% has been completely wiped out. And this is also really goofy. And I would have thought that this was made up if it wasn't for a video of this. But Belarus has now accused Poland. Yes, we're now talking about this on the news. Uh, they've accused Poland of hurling a stone with a slingshot at the border checkpoint of the countries. Yes. We, and we watched that. This is at a border checkpoint. Belarus and Poland. Yeah, and Belarus is a more of a puppet to Russia. Here's some geography for you. So, you know, here's Belarus, north of Ukraine. There's Poland. And there, that's the situation here. Here's a, a border. At the border, they really did this. We watched this, the clip yesterday. Let's see. So here is that video. It's a dandy. Hit him with a slingshot. No shitting. And I... They actually went through the time to mark, legit mark. See, see this photo? They literally went through and marked it as evidence. The little slingshot ball. I I, I, I guess this is going to be considered uh, an act of war. I have no idea, but I thought I would share it with you guys. Really goofy. That's something that they had to come out and talk about. One of your people slung a slingshot round at us. Anyway, about a week ago, we talked about how dumb it was for the Russians to be building trenches in the Red Forest due to the radiation that's in Chernobyl. We all know this. I mean, why would you want to do that? I mean, what male is going to want his his nether regions inside of a hole that is filled with radiation? No, no one. Well, anyway, it came out there. Uh, they're actually using maps from 1985. OK, you know what happened in 1986? That's when the disaster happened. So they're actually using maps from a year prior of the nuclear disaster actually happening. So they didn't actually know where the Red Forest was and I actually have an image of that map, which you are what? currently seeing. And that's. That's a dandy. So where do you go? Second most powerful military on planet Earth. You're doing a fantastic job to make sure your men are in the right place. <laughs> Sarcasm. Sarcasm. It's second most powerful military, dude. No, uh, I don't even know if they can rank them there. Just maybe because of their, because of their rocket capabilities, but their, their soldiers, their, their actual ground forces are nothing to be. They're not anything to be in the top for things to fear but definitely their i mean their missile capabilities and shit that they're uh, it also look like nato countries are moving a ton of artillery right you now. see nothing but terrible russian tactics from the beginning like they haven't they've been gotten destroyed on the ground their mechanized infantry has gotten destroyed it's they're terrible to poland just outside of or it's in poland it's actually in the town of i'm probably gonna jack this up nizio nizio poland uh here is it's been geolocated by the way Daniel Dyer, thanks for the stream. Rock Hassan. And if you guys were wondering, here's a video of that. It's going to consist of, I believe, Paladins so and M992s. I know, right? They didn't have the exclusion zone on that map that they can't go those to. Those M992s you guys just saw in the Paladins, clearly the Paladins, everybody knows what those are. But the M992s, those things, they can be utilized for artillery and medevac and infantry. Like, I, I've seen them. I've actually been inside of them. They're very short. Like, the little tiny ramp comes down, and then the, the top of them actually slides all the way out, and then you can shoot artillery rounds out of it. It's like a mobile artillery piece. So, The U.S. has actually given 7,000 javelins, which is one-third of the entire American stockpile, will will take over a year to replace. The U.S. has also given 2,000 stingers, which is one quarter of the inventory, which takes about five years to replace. Now, I know this may seem like kind of a big deal. I think it is kind of a big deal. I mean, for the amount of money we spent on this stuff, but the time it takes to replenish the stuff we were giving them, that's also a big deal. But we have taken out or helped the Ukrainian forces, that is the Americans, facilitate taking out a significant, I think it's roughly around 420 tanks. Hmm. 420 tanks, I think it was like 422. That is a ton of tanks. That's more than I believe Germany and Poland has combined. Yeah, that's a lot. So we're going to go over here to the handy dandy map that I actually have drawn up. So there has been a little bit of action 
uh, mainly around Kharkiv. So Ukrainian troops have launched a counteroffensive just northwest of Kharkiv and regained control of the town of Zolochohiv. So it's just right here. They've actually taken back quite a bit of area as well. They controlled, the Russian forces did of 24 hours ago, they controlled an area kind of like this. So they've actually taken back a pretty significant ground. And if you guys can look, this is going to be another main route area. This area has a, you guys didn't like it when I use the terms of spidey veins, but I kind of like that term. That's pretty much it. The logistical routes coming in on that northwest side, that's kind of a big deal. So they did take that back. And I'm, I'm assuming they're going to continue to try to push even more easternly to try to take this area right here, which is going to be that main route going in e105 is going to be the main one that they really care about because that's where we know a lot of the men are coming in from belgorod which is right here which we know i'm going to say this right now and only one time only this is a staging ground which they refit and bring men in and out of ukraine mm -hmm. the russians that is ukrainian special forces did some damage to a railway bridge behind enemy lines so here's the images and then i'm going to pull it up real quick over here on google earth and give you guys an like the exact location i've geolocated it back to the exact bridge they actually took out so here is the grid corner for you guys just northeast of Kharkiv, just north of the town of Vovchansk, right there so here it is so here's that actual bridge so there's a railway you guys can actually see it right here it is indicated and actually shown i can actually you know let's go ahead and bring this thing up and change the layers so we can show satellite for you guys so there is the bridge that they actually have taken out i know it didn't completely take out the bridge which I'm sure they were really trying to do that, but they did damage the railway that does come into that northern side of Kharkiv, so it's going to be very difficult for the Russians to actually do any type of uh, logistical moving of, of men and supplies into that northern side, so that is kind of a big deal. We can actually Who is here for the bridge? Who remembers the bridge? $2 newbie on YouTube live stream. Thank you, Lynette. Thank you so much. The Lubny Bridge, which actually the city of Lubny was a, a crucial city. It, it was early Should on. just show world. you guys where that's at? That's roughly right about here. That does show you exactly where they're able. I can't believe they're actually able to push a, a special forces unit on the opposite side of the country, literally push into Russia and then destroy a railway system. So that is a, uh, that's kind of a big deal. So this is a pretty bad. Hey, appreciate that, Sky Guy. He said, love my nightly speak the Drew. Bad one, but Russian troops are now being accused of placing a group of women in a basement. Yes, women inside of a basement for 25 days. Nine of them are now pregnant and did not give consent. I will not go into any more detail due to how horrific, how horrific the case is, as you guys can probably tell what it is. I'm not going to go in there. I've, I've seen multiple, multiple, multiple stories talking about this kind of stuff that's going on. And I don't want to talk about it on here. I think it's a, it's, it's, I think it's a more sensitive subject to myself than, it, than, than war, so I'm just going to leave it at that. And we're going to move on. But you guys get the point of what's going on. It's not good. It is terrible. The things they are doing, the things they are getting away with, they're horrendous. They're barbaric. So down in Mariupol. We're going to go ahead and slide down here. There's, this is the time I think is coming for Mariupol when the last stand is actually coming on. There hasn't been a lot of change that I could show you guys when it comes to, to mapping down in there. Uh, the word is coming out that a possible surrender from Ukrainian forces down in Mariupol could happen within the next few days. Nat, yes, that was the musket man on the, on the Lubny Bridge. We saw that we were watching the Territorial Defense Force uh, setting up a security point on the Lubny Bridge. So, yeah, that was the musket man. Yes. Uh, this is coming from a Ukrainian source that is very credible. They say that they have almost ran out of food and they have no ammunition. I mean, this is pretty much, this was the inevitable. We knew it was going to happen. This was pretty much their last stand inside of this area. Um, there was an attempt, by the way, if you guys did not know, to break out inside of Mariupol where 1,500 Ukrainian troops tried to push through the Russian front line. 800 of the 1,500 were supposed to clear a path where the rest could actually follow through. So over 100 Ukrainian naval infantrymen from this area that actually tried to push through have actually surrendered and we're now taken as POWs. So there's been 10 groups right now that have actually been able to disperse that consist of three to four men have been scattered and have been trying to attempt to slip through Russian front lines. These men are currently being pursued by Spetna. So that's actually what's been going down into Mariupol. I know they are attempting to actually push through and Zelensky has actually came down and he said, if you guys give us bigger equipment, bigger guns, bigger everything, we might be able to actually help the men down in Mariupol. I don't know if that's the case. I really don't. I don't, I, I, I haven't been there. No one's, no one, no one from the West is, is actually seeing what it's like other than the video that comes out. We have seen it on this channel. It is really horrific what they've been doing. Now for the, for the last piece, I'm going to tell you guys right now, this is going to get like, I know I keep saying this, but I'm not the only one that is saying this. Over the next two weeks, I, I'm telling you, well, they're having a buildup. The Russian forces are inside of this area. They're trying to find a way to slip through this eastern front. They really are. And once they do, I think they're just going to push all their men out. I think that's one of the things that's been going on. There's pretty much a bunch of cannon fodder going on inside of this area right now. 
they're losing a significant amount of men and, and, and equipment up in here, but I don't think they really care. All they care about is actually slipping through and gaining access to one of these main routes. All the yellow lines you guys see, all these yellow lines are extremely crucial to get these supplies in and out. And I think that's going to be one of the things we see over the next couple of weeks. We know that, that the southern side of Izium, the northern northwest side of Slovinask, we know that's going to be a very crucial uh, crucial area for the Russian forces. And this is going to be decisive points for this entire war. So I think the Russian forces, why they haven't been pushing their elements out so fast and so furious this time, is because they know this. This is the decisive point. This is going to be their last chance to actually take Ukraine as a whole. And that's why we haven't seen a lot of movement inside of these areas because they're building up their troops for one very large push. I've seen through multiple accounts on multiple different platforms that everybody is starting to shift. Like Ukrainian forces are shifting east right now. So that's another thing you got to think about as well. These Russian forces that are sitting up here in the north, I guess we're going to say the northwest side of their front line, this entire area, now have to worry about Ukrainian troops coming in from this way. So now they have to be on the offensive and the defensive at one po at that same time. So Mel C says, tried to send a chat about old maps, but totally got distracted by the bridge. I will visit the, our bridge one day. Especially since up here in Kharkiv. So that is also another reason why we may not be seeing them pushing out is because they are setting up defensive pitches and knowing they know that the Ukrainian forces are going to be coming in from their rear while they try to push into Slovenask. So... As of right now, I mean, the Ukrainian forces really have freedom of movement to actually move a ton of men if they wanted to into Slovenia. I have seen a couple different reports come out that say that they believe that Kiev could be another uh, another push on Kiev could happen. But I, I haven't seen that to be the case because, for one, they don't have a lot of troops up there to do that. And they, I mean, most of them are inside of Belarus and or Russia. So that's pretty much it. We're going to wait to see what comes out on this Mariupol uh, deal. I, I don't know if that's 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 really going to be something. I, I and, and I told you guys. The timing is really kind of interesting for them to come out and say, yes, a chemical attack happened. I think the Azaz might have just been looking for a reason for the West to come out and say, yes, we're getting involved now. But I have seen all this troop buildup inside of Poland. It's just everything's getting kind of hairy. Got a little bit. It's a little getting hairy. Everything's getting hairy, but at the same time, unverified reports. But our United Kingdom, the United Kingdom and the United States and NATO countries are pretty unified in that any any chemical weapons usage would be like would be like it's time it's it would be one of those situations where the nato would get involved more than just sanctioning and at least that's what they've said that's that's their words uk the united kingdom said that all options would be on the table <clears throat> all right this is from the ministry of defense today this is from uh, the uk 16 minutes ago, intelligence update. Russia's appointment of Army General Alexander Dovinikov as commander of the war in Ukraine represents an attempt to centralize command and control. An inability to cohere, excuse me, and coordinate military activity has hampered Russia's invasion to date. Like many senior Russian generals, Dovinikov has previously commanded experience in Syria. Furthermore, since 2016, he has commanded Russia's southern military district bordering Ukraine's Donbass region. Russian messaging has recently em emphasized progressing offensives in the Donbass as Russia's forces refocus eastwards. Dvornikov's selection further demonstrates how determined Ukrainian resistance and ineffective pre-war planning have forced, <coughs> excuse me, have forced Russia to reassess its operations. UK intelligence update. So just that they appointed a new army general. Russia did. Apparently he's going to know what he's doing. They're on their ninth general, I think, now. Comment where you guys are tuning in from if you haven't. Where are you guys watching from? What city? What state? Where in the world are you guys watching? I'm Andrew Mercado from Mercado Media, independent news, not no sponsor, sponsored by you guys, the viewer. Thank you for the super chats and the super stickers and all of our members of the channel. Thank you to everybody for keeping it going. But comment where you guys are watching from. I'm I'm streaming from Minnesota. I am I am in Minnesota. I was about to say I was stationed in Minnesota. All the war talk. Perth, Australia. How you doing, Reg? Welcome. Welcome. Let me pull up. Let me see what we got in our 
Kdrav's TikTok crew at it again. I'm going to pull up our Discord server. We have video to go through. Join our Discord server if you haven't. <clears throat> we got Mid-Florida's tuned in. New Jersey's tuned in. Do they? We got Mississippi. New Australia. Welcome. Oh, no. NSW Australia. I read that wrong. Ontario. Arizona. BC, Canada. Nebraska. Welcome. New York, but born in Ukraine. So let's also just go over, in general, some of the news. Let's pull this up here. From today, I'll do a recap while you guys are checking in. Let me pull up the video from today. Okay. So, look, you can find this in our description of the video. 19 people were injured, 10 shot in a New York City subway station during morning rush hour, police said. Authorities say they are still looking for a suspect. The shooting took place at 36th Street and Station in Brooklyn Sunset Park around 8.30 in the morning. All victims are expected to survive. Frank James has been listed as a person of interest. Keys were found on the subway for a U-Haul van, later located by police approximately five miles from the incident. That was rented to Mr. James in Philadelphia. James has addresses linking him to both Wisconsin and Philadelphia. According to USA Today, authorities say the gunman fired 33 times with a Glock 17 9mm semi-handgun, which was found in the subway. Searching the subway car, investigators also found two non-detonated smoke grenades, a hatchet, gasoline, fireworks, and keys to a U-Haul van. A reward of 50000 is now being offered for any information regarding today's events. So this happened in New York City today. Graphic content, there's just, we're going to be, uh, there's blood in the video. Nobody died from this incident. No deaths, miraculously. We got New Orleans tuned in. Welcome. Anybody from New York tuned in? Anybody from New York? So this, this happened in New York City today. Some images, <clears throat> some of the images are going to have blood in it from the scene, but nobody died. Ashan from Portland. And then we'll pull up the video from the subway. This is from the subway. <laughs>
charge. He then opened fire, striking multiple people on the subway and in the platform. Again, we would describe him as an individual. He is being reported as a male black, approximately five feet, five inches tall with a heavy build. He was wearing a green construction type vest and a hooded sweatshirt. All right, and then from our Twitter, <clears throat> this is the U-Haul van that was parked. The U-Haul van that was five miles away from where a man opened fire, and then the keys to this U-Haul van were located uh, with the items at the scene. And then it's it belong, Frank, Frank James, who's a person of interest, is linked to this U-Haul van, and he has residencies in Wisconsin and Philadelphia, uh, it, it hasn't been they don't have anybody in custody just frank james is a person of interest who's linked to this uh u-haul van on a king's highway between west third and west fourth streets just after four o'clock this afternoon police spotted or somebody spotted i should say this white u-haul van that they have been looking for for a good portion of the day they believe this is uh, in connection with that shooting uh on the subway earlier today in brooklyn the plates do match what the description of the van was put out there earlier there you can see that van parked on the side of the road now we can tell you right now that there's a large area of uh king's highway shut down here from west second to west fifth street police still waiting for more crews to arrive on the scene to investigate the situation Situation. But again, the van is suspected of being connected to the incident on the subway in Brooklyn here earlier. Uh, it has been found on King's Highway. We'll keep you up. Not a King's Highway, right. but you West King's Highway. Let's look up this really quick. New New York subway. So that's from Reuters. We saw this. This is uh, the incident. Oh, that's from 2021. What? Let's do latest. Several people were shot in a subway station. We saw that. Um, say hello. No. Manhunt is underway in New York City. After a male allegedly set off a smoke bomb and opened fire on a subway during morning rush hour yesterday. Or it would have been earlier. Yeah, yesterday now at this point in the United States. Multiple people shot and 13 hospitalized. Suspect at large. Just going over the... Seeing if there's any updates to it at all. Oh, it doesn't seem to be any updates with this. Uh, this was 16 hours ago. A video showed a, a video. The video, <clears throat> excuse me. Video showed the immediate aftermath of the subway attack in Brooklyn. <laughs> Oh my God, my anxiety on the, I would struggle with this. Like I can't breathe. I struggle to breathe with like non, like with chemicals around or anything. I like, it is like triggers my anxiety or whatever. I can't do, I don't do well unless I have a gas mask on. You guys have seen me in tear gas, but like it still gives me great anxiety of not being able to breathe. And like, you're trapped in that subway, you're trapped in that subway car. They were trapped in this until the subway car stopped. Oh my God, there's like no way off. Oh. Wait, 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 because everybody's crazy now. Yeah, I was ex-military. That gas chamber day was the worst for me. Still did it though. Listen, just because I'm a, just because I would give me anxiety and like I'd power through it, but like I'm telling you, I would f like internally freak out in this situation. I wouldn't, I wouldn't show it, but I would be sitting there going through it in my mind. <laughs> The gas chamber and the the tower where you had to repel off of it, the confidence course tower, that was the two biggest things that scared the shit out of me in training, but I still did it. Dude, it couldn't do I couldn't be you, there's no there's nowhere to go though, that's why. I'm claustrophobic in like small spaces. So you're with a whole bunch of people, you're in that train car, that would have been terrible. Terrible experience. Terrible experience in there. Wait, 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 because everybody.
Maris Grand Final. That was from the subway train. This is like this is when they got off. Six reportedly injured in a possible shooting at some. This was yesterday. <laughs> We had civilians helping other one other people on the subway it looked like we saw that cnn did the multiple reports have you police this is what it looked like yesterday in brooklyn following a shooting in new york city We're likely going to get further details today it's been a busy it was a busy day for those that live in new york So that's what was going on in New York. <clears throat> Hopefully we'll get further updates today or they'll catch the person responsible or uh, they have all their resources on it. All of New York City Re Police Department resources are on that. So continuing on the other news that, have, that has been going on, Finnish telecommunications company Nokia has announced its departure from the Russian market. Russia is deploying heavy military equipments towards the border with Finland after Finland and Sweden are considering joining NATO. That, that to me, is like the biggest... I don't think people are... I'm, it could be. Maybe I'm just missing it. Maybe I'm missing out on the news. Or if there's anybody that are, is reporting on this broadly. They're, I mean, they're reporting that it's happening, but not like... Sweden wins the NATO lottery. Sweden wins the NATO lottery. For years, decades, in fact, Sweden and Finland have been united in their loyalty to each other as well as their cherished military non-alignment. In recent months, though, polls have shown both countries to be increasingly keen on joining NATO, with Swedes consistently more eager to do so than their Finnish neighbors. Yet for Sweden... The question remained as to how the military alliance without excuse me how to join the military alliance without aggravating the part of the population that was reluctant, let alone Moscow. And now it looks like Sweden stars may be finally aligning, though almost no effort on its own. When it comes to the prospect of joining NATO, Finland and Swedes' fates have long been intertwined, with an understanding that the two countries would always join together should they choose to do so. And though for decades Swedes have viewed NATO membership more, favor more favorably, with polls in recent years consistently showing support of 30% or higher, despite comparatively high opposition, none of this really mattered as long as Helinski remained uninterested. And in Finland, NATO support remained firmly below 30%. Indeed, well, Finland, or, that you could pro like, probably understand that because Finland's the one right next to Russia. That'd be a direct, I mean, Russia's already made it out like that'd be a direct act of war. If, or at least if you have any interest or if you join at this point. 
So Finland's the one touching Russia, right? Let's get better, is it? Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has altered this dependable balance. Last December, Finland's Ministry of Defense released its annual survey on national security with support for NATO membership coming in at 24%, a small increase from the previous report. Just four months later, support has now soared to a mind-boggling 68%. And Finland's parliament is expected to be briefed on prospective NATO membership by intelligence officials this week. So if you get Sweden and Finland are like in on it together, if they're going to join NATO, it's going to be both of them. There I went from 24%. What year was that? Last year, last December. <clears throat> no, Sweden isn't far either, but it's understand understandably why Finland is, has been traditionally less keen on joining NATO. Because it's a provoca it's an act of it's a provocation for Russia's labeled it a provocation. It wouldn't be a provocation if Russia didn't label it as one. But it's, it's it's countries are being forced almost into it. Finland's reversal on NATO membership is nothing short of extraordinary. So extraordinary, in fact, that Sweden's government is struggling to comprehend it. But it has also presented Sweden with the most incredible opportunity in terms of its potential ascension to NATO. Taking the lead on the matter, Finland is now energetically stepping forward, sparing Sweden the trouble of having to break the ice on NATO matters. So not also Sweden's like wanted to do it, but again, they're like Sweden and Finland are like, you know, they're like together. They had a non, what is it? A non, uh, non alignment there. They have a military non alignment. And so Sweden's like, yo, dang, we're actually, this is good for us because we want to join NATO and like the fact that Finland's leading their own charge to join NATO now this is going to help Sweden join it has presented Sweden with the most incredible opportunity in terms of its potential ascension to NATO taking the lead on the matter Finland is now energetically stepping forward sparing Sweden the trouble of having to break the ice on NATO matters it's even absorbing the much feared Russian blow that has so far included not just threats but cyber attacks against its foreign and defense ministries. Russia is, of course, doing its part by demonstrating to all and sundry that it is not a country in which one can expect good faith relations. As Marin observed this month, Russia is not the neighbor we thought it was. Don't blame me either. Every every peace talk that they held in the early on of the war in Ukraine, Russia didn't obey any of it. And then they were flat out denying anything that they were doing. Who would who would want to believe or trust anything Russia does? So that is Sweden and NATO. Want, or Sweden and Finland wanting to join NATO. Let's pull up the list and see if there's anything new. From the UN, 4,450 civilian casualties in Ukraine as a result of Russia's war. I suppose we can finish going through the war combat footage from Rob Lee from the from yesterday. This is Chechen Rosgavirda troops fighting in Mariupol. So Chechen che Chechen troops, Mariupol, southeastern port city, down here. The last city remaining on the on the east the southeastern region that is in, in uh, Russian controlled territory now.
Alright. <clears throat> Chechen forces. Mariupol. I think they're just blind firing to me. Like that's my first reaction is they're just blind firing. Chechen forces in Russia, excuse me, in Ukraine. Continuing down, this is one or two destroyed 2S1 Gvazdika howitzers. Going through some of the combat footage and combat clips, aftermath clips right now from the war in Ukraine. Like the video if you guys haven't, we're at 633. Like the video, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Make sure you guys are subscribed. Where you call Sasha? Continuing on, destroyed Russian T, excuse me, destroyed Russian BTR 82A and a tank in the Chernihiv Oblast. Chernihiv is up here to the northeast. Chernihiv Oblast. Up here. Here's Kiev. And Chernihiv up here to the northeast. Here it is on a big map. Kiev. Chernihiv. Alright, destroyed Russian BTR 82A and a tank in a Chernihiv Oblast. A destroyed Russian Tiger M and a BTR 82A. Okay, very loud music, don't need it. That's the Tiger. And there's the BTR. Tiger. And BTR. Continuing on. We saw that. We saw that. We saw that. Here is video of Ukrainian UAV dropping munitions on a Russian on Russian armored vehicles. Music's a big thing here. I feel like voting on the poll is one side because there are many reasons why someone would need 
to leave. Well, I mean, you don't... If you would need to leave, you need to leave. That's why the poll's there. You don't have to explain unless you want to. But situation also, obviously your situation now could change. And then like you, you being able to stay and help defend your town might change depending on your family situation or your money. The amount of resources available to you. If you have land. If you live like me in an apartment, I probably would likely not stay here and defend the apartment, but like, you know, if I had my own land, like farmers, all right. This is a video of a KA-52 helicopter strikes with Vicar ATGMs. So this is from, this is a Russian side video. They're KA-52 helicopters. All right, continuing on, let's go to John. I don't know if he's posted an update yet, but if you guys missed his update, his latest one. Oh, he did. Oh, no, that's old now. Wow. Oh, well, we're way far down. What is going on here? Why are we so far? There we go. Now we're at the top four hours ago so he hasn't posted a diary yet but we'll watch his most recent one keep diary day 48 but they're on 49 now so the newest one he'll post will be day 49 john sweeney an old bbc reporter he's got a podcast talking about putin now so you can find that on his patreon orange hats in the chat cool. keep diary day 48 of vladimir putin's war the Russians appoint a new general to command the war in the south. His name is Vornikov, and he is the butcher of Aleppo. Last night, Ukrainians fighting in besieged and encircled Mariupol suspect that poison gas, chemical weapons was used, sarin. It's impossible to confirm it because Mariupol is closed apart from this sort of tiny band of heroic Ukrainian fighters. I believe, I believe them, because it fits a pattern. The pattern goes back to something very early on, nothing to do with Vonikov, but with the childhood of Vladimir Putin. He describes when he's brought up dirt poor um, in a really grim flat in Paul Leningrad, now in St. Petersburg. There's tons of rats. He, they used to, him and his mates used to hunt them with sticks and then once the, uh, the rat gets cornered and the rat goes for him and he runs to his flat and slams the door on the rat's snout. And it struck me actually that hitting rats with sticks is not an efficient way to kill the vermin. The best way, of course, is rat poison. No, it's not in Putin's ghosted um, autobiography, First Person. But I believe that Vladimir Putin has been obsessed with poison and poisoning his enemies his whole life. And it started from when he used rat poison as a boy. 
Thank you, Nat. There's more of this in my podcast, Taking on Putin, which tries to get inside his head as best we can. From Kiev. All right. John, John's diary update from today. Let's do a refresh on what is this here now from the, the defense of Ukraine. Conquering destruction is the power of creation. We have created and creating will create. It's DNA. Lead is one of those who care about the fate of their country, their defenders and relatives, believing that the fastest victory the girl gives the most valuable thing for the front her time, strength and energy. Стала частиною ТРО формувань. У мене є родичка, яка у ЗСУ працює. Ось, і я вирішила бути корисною. Протидія руйнації це сила створення. І ось ми створюємо, створюємо і будемо створювати. Бо це така, це така ДНК України. Таке ДНК України створювати попри все. Раніше були супергерої Марвел і DC, а тепер я 100% впевнена, що наші бійці, наші ЗСУ, ТРО, всі-всі-всі військові – це справжні супергерої. І дякую їм величезно за те, що вони роблять кожного дня. Вірю в них дуже сильно. І, звісно, Україна переможе. Все буде Україна. What is this here 40 minutes ago? The Russian pontoon bridge together with equipment was destroyed, location unknown. So here's destroyed Russian equipment and a bridge. <laughs> Same sound that's used for 90% of the war TikToks, the war talks. War talks theme song. As of April 13th, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, 191 children have been killed and 349 children have been wounded. Reminder, within eight years of the war in Donbass, 152 children were killed. That's until 2020. I wonder what the 2022 number Presidents of Poland and the Baltic states to meet with Zelensky on April 13th, so they're going to meet today. Jacob Kumok, who leads, who leads, excuse me, who heads the Polish International Policy Bureau and is accom accompanying the Polish president, said our goal is to support President Zelensky and the defenders of Ukraine at a crucial moment. So Poland and Baltic states to meet with Zelensky today. A Russian Su-25 plane was shot down by Ukrainian Air Force, and the enemy has significantly reduced the use of aircraft due to weather conditions. They've reduced their air for they've reduced their use of aircraft, citing weather conditions. Overnight, Russian army conducted missile strikes at a railway station in central Ukraine. Routes of 17 trains changed due to safety concerns. <clears throat> Satellite imagery of what remains of Mariupol's Azovstal steel factory, which has been the scene of intense fighting for weeks. Also, images of Mariupol port facilities and burning buildings and burning findings, excuse me, and burning buildings in eastern Mariupol. Wow, just. This is the latest satellite imagery from Maxar Technologies. Smoke ever smoke everywhere. Presidents of Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia are traveling to Kiev. This is the picture. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So we're gonna see video today for the night stream for the nine PM stream tomorrow of the these presidents walking with Zelensky in Kiev. Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia. They're on their way. And then the Ministry of Defense update. 
Russia's appointment of Army General Alexander Davinarkov as commander of the war in Ukraine represents an attempt to centralize command and control. An inability to cohere and coordinate military activity has hampered Russia's invasion to date. Like many senior Russian generals, Davinarkov has previously commanded as previous commands experienced in Syria. Furthermore, since 2016, he has commanded Russia's southern military district bordering Ukraine's Donbass region. Russia's messaging has recently emphasized progressing offensives in the Donbass as Russian forces refocus eastwards. Davinikov's selection further demonstrates how determined Ukrainian resistance and ineffective pre-war planning have forced Russia to reassess its operations. All right. So... With that being said, y'all, I'm gonna leave you with one video. This is an old one. This is from March eighth, but with all the with all the news going on, this is uh, I want you. I want to play this again one more time. This is in Odessa, when like the war was like still in its early stages. If you missed this, this was from Odessa. Odessa was Odessa is over here, one of the port cities, right here on the map. So. This was on March 8th, but with all the news going on, I'm going to leave you guys with this, with this video. It's a good one. All right, y'all. I want to leave you guys with that video to go to to leave y'all with. We'll be back tomorrow night. Like the video if you guys have it. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Thank you again so much for choosing independent media to cover the war in Ukraine and now beyond. We're expanding and going and covering other news happenings. And thank you guys for supporting that. And thank you for being month for those that are members sending super chat super stickers and it helps me get out and report and get equipment uh, including the vest and the all the gear that i need to do my own reporting thank you guys for letting it for keeping the dream alive thank you guys for choosing mercado media as your source for everything ukraine for everything in the world i'm andrew mercado have a wonderful night y'all and take care Thank you.